Welcome to Hot Chips 34. Tutorial 2 Heterogeneous Compilation in MLIR. Hi, my name is Steve Neuendorfer, and I'm here, uh, the chair of the MLIR tutorial at Hot Chips this year. Uh, so probably many of you are familiar with this big challenge that we have in the industry where uh, there's a real end of technology scaling. And uh, if you look at some of our industry pundits, what they believe is that this, there's going to be a new age of computer architecture. Um, and this new age of computer architecture is because we can no longer rely on the uh, technology scaling in order to provide additional uh, benefit and quality of result in the devices that we're, that we're building. Uh, we believe that there's going to be a new golden age of compilers in response to this new golden age of computer architecture. Um, and uh, this tutorial is particularly about MLIR, which is a next generation compiler infrastructure that's uh, really oriented and well positioned to support this new golden age of computer architecture. Uh, and I think today in the tutorial, you'll see uh, a few different aspects of MLIR. There's parts that are closer to the front end languages, uh, particularly around machine learning, but also more than just machine learning. Uh, MLIR also supports uh, a wide range of, of input frameworks such as uh, Fortran and uh, TensorFlow and C code. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of middle-end optimizations that come in MLIR, and uh, you'll also see a few backends, both for uh, CPUs and GPUs, but also for FPGAs and ASIC technology. Uh, so what you can see then is that MLIR is well positioned to sort of sp span the whole gap from high-level abstractions uh, representing machine learning or high-performance computing or DSP processing, all the way down to the, the back-end code generation for CPUs, GPUs, uh, programmable logic, or other kinds of accelerators like what uh, AMD Xilinx calls the ACAP architecture. Uh, so we have a, a great infrastructure that supports uh, the entire space of the, the tool chains from front-ends to back-ends. Uh, it supports a wide range of different targets, supports a wide range of different application domains, um, and is also uh, widely supported in open source. So what this allows people to do is to add on to the open source infrastructure um, and also to interface to any necessary uh, backend proprietary tools. So our agenda today is uh, that we're gonna have uh, Jacques is here to talk about some of the MLIR basics. Uh, then we're gonna have a talk about uh, CPU and GPU code generation. Uh, then we're gonna switch into more of the end-to-end -end flows. Uh, so we have uh, Siraj talking about uh, machine learning front ends and in particular a framework that ARM is, uh, has been developing called TOSA. And uh, then the FPGA and ASIC backends, uh, a project called Circuit. Uh, so to begin with, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Jacques. So Jacques is a, uh, from Google and has been involved in MLIR since the very beginning and uh, is going to be telling us a lot about the MLIR basics. Um, and uh, so I will hand it off to Jacques. Well, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, and so, like, hi, my name is Jacques. Uh, I'll be talking today a little bit about like MLIR as well as the um, you know, like the philosophy behind uh, the, the project, as well as all the, the things we're, we're doing there. Uh, let me just one minute to switch to the, the, the next slides. Um, okay, so, you know, and as I mentioned, this is sort of like the outline for today. You know, we'll talk a little about philosophy, what you get in a box, and then we'll have a, a question session after this. Uh, you know, I just wanna say like, it's, it's quite a big privilege to be here, you know, with the, at, at Hot Chips, you know, I, I think it's, uh, a lot of fun for me. Um, so as a brief introduction, you know, MLIR is a collection of modular and reusable software components that enable the progressive lowering of high-level operations to efficiently target hardware in a common way. So MLIR is a new compiler infrastructure that was originally built by a team in the TensorFlow ecosystem, but is now under neutral governance as part of the LVM project. 
And so this is a project that, as Stephen mentioned, is like in the, uh, in the open source, big open community, and a lot of focus on actually collaboration between multiple different uh, companies, universities, academia, research labs, all together. Now, I'm going to tell a little bit about MLIR's design by sort of going back to like its origin. So we were looking around in the TensorFlow ecosystem, we noticed like we have a lot of graph compilers. You know, we have multiple different frameworks doing graph optimizations, multiple redundancies. We have a lot of systems where you have different infrastructure doing different optimizations that are very similar for different flows. This resulted, and of course, a lot of duplication, but as well as in a lot of broken user journeys where we have different, depending on the, the path you're following, you, you get different uh, uh, behavior, you get different support, and just this wasn't ideal. So we decided, okay, well, let's look a little bit at the compiler community more in general, right? So LVM, industry standard for compiler infrastructure, the LVM IR has proven itself as a versatile mid-level representation similar to C with vectors in SSA. But the LVM IR is not low level, uh, is not enough for low level representations. So the result was there was introduction of multiple different low level representations from global ISIL, machine IR, to uh, MCIR, all to target these lower levels of the abstractions that are needed and that were introduced over time. But vice versa, LVM IR is not enough for the high level representation. So uh, today, for example, if we look, you have your input to, to Clang, your C, C++, Objective C, CUDA, all of these. And then there's a relatively convoluted path to the LLVMIR. There's a huge abstraction gap between the AST that represents the, the input user program to the LLVMIR that can be used as the mid-level as well as for code generation. And so this is all covered in one long shot conversion in Clang today. Well, that's sort of true. Clang also has introduced a couple of representations in parallel with the AST. So for example, you have the Clang CFG that is used in some of the static analyzers as well as various advanced diagnostics. And then you have things like some tools, for example, like Poly, that tries and raise the abstraction back up again to, from the LVM IR, to higher level constructs to be able to do optimizations on loops and the like. Now, if we look at newer languages, then we notice that most of them have defined a custom intermediate representation between the AST and the LVM IR for language-specific analysis and transformations. So from Swift, Rust, Julia, all of these have introduced their own intermediate representation that allows for these language-specific optimizations and avoids this massive gap to the, L the LVM IR from the AST. Now, as we said, this is not just true for, for programming language input. We saw the same in modern ML frameworks, which includes like domain-specific compilers uh, and infrastructure for these domains. And so as an example, if you look at the, the TensorFlow graph, you know, from its input to representation as XLA HLO to LVMIR, right? We saw this. Now, the, the problem here is like we have a lot of common code being duplicated over and over again, right? So, if you look at all this construction, you have duplication with respect to type system support, common optimization passes such as uh, CSE, DCE, as well as some canonicalizations into getting it into a minimal form for optimization transformation. The location tracking and diagnostics are duplicated. They, they are um, you know, not consistent in their handling. They get dropped. We have past managements that we can copy it. We have a lot of the same basic concepts being duplicated over and over again. You know, and this was not ideal. So, what, and to give you, this is where we sort of started with when thinking about MLR. Because what we said is like, hey, you know what, it's actually great all these domain specific intermediate representations. They enable for high level domain specific optimizations that, uh, that don't require heroics to do. You have your loop, you, you unroll your loop. They enable for progressive lowering which enables re reuse across these multiple levels. They have great location tracking that enables some more uh, flow sensitive type checking. You know, and all, like, this is really great things to have. This is why all these newer languages have introduced them. But the part that's not great here is, this is actually a huge expense to build this infrastructure. So to build this domain specific IRs and optimizations requires a huge investment. It requires re-implementation of all the same stuff. Right, so you have to redo pass managers, and 
I think most importantly, innovations in one community don't benefit the others. So it means we, this results in a system where we have a lot of good ideas locked up in different systems that are not able to benefit one another. And so this is sort of like the, the context where we wanted to build MLR, right? So we're saying, like, how do we get this ability to have these, like, the great benefits of the domain-specific intermediate representation while not having all these downsides and, and duplication? So you can think of MLR as a toolkit for representing and transforming code. It enables you to represent and transform IR within the same level of abstraction, across different IR representations of the same level, as well as lowering down to cogen. MLIR allows you to represent multiple levels of the IR at the same time, whether this be the tree-based IRs, such as ASTs, graph-based IRs, or machine instructions at the lower level. So it can represent all of these, and as well, it can represent all of these at the same time. Now, it does so while enabling you know, a, a, a common compiler infrastructure, location tracking, richer type system, common set of passes for analysis, optimizations, common abstractions, interfaces, data flow, framework, all these things, uh, while enabling you to model your problem domain. So if you saw on the previous slide, you, you saw perhaps a couple of arrows, like within, across, and, and down. And it almost feels like there's one direction missing, up. Well, it's, it's sort of missing. So and it's one of the things that made us in the design of MLIR to, to think about all this constraint. And it is because it's almost e always easier to preserve than recover information. Lifting to a high level of abstraction is very fragile from a lower one. And most, more importantly, it's almost impossible to recover user intent once lowered down. So in MLIR, we wanted to enable that you, we do, you don't have to destroy information structure informational structure that you'll need to recover later. So don't throw away things that you'd have to then recover. And for me, one of my favorite examples here and one that I worked on for a bit is, for example, TensorFlow Control Flow V1. We have a case where at the user level, uh, the user writes a program with a conditional which says, if something is true, do X, else do Y. From this, it gets converted into a data flow computing graph. So this is something that looks very familiar to folks from you know, looking at all the classical data computing, you have switch and merge nodes for the control for representation, and it's quite amenable for distributed execution, all of these nice things. Except what, what XLA actually wants is, it wants, if X is true, do Y, else do, do Z. It wants what the user has written, and instead we have to do, you know, a lot of analysis to be able to recover what the user had given us originally. And so this is one of the things we wanted to avoid and be able to have a system which you don't need to do this. I also talked before about you know, how MLIR enables you uh, to mix and match in a single IR. So you can use MLIR to represent like a TensorFlow convolution. You have your Conf2D with your input, your strides, your padding, dilation, all of these. You can then lower to, to XLA, H low, and so for example you have Perhaps at some point you're all to all collective op, communication, and then finally lowering down to the LVMIR. So it enables you to lower all of these things progressively down, but it also enables you to mix and match all of these together in the same IR. So you can end up with a part during the computation where you have a TensorFlow op as well as an MHLow op, right? And this is, you know, enables you to be able to target different parts at different sections. So for, for different accelerators, different deployments, you may want to be able to, to lower at different points and lower different ops. And, you know, and sort of just as an aside, you know, it's one of those things where I very rarely work with only one, one dialect at a time, right? So it's in most of the computations we, I actually run into is we have this progressive lowering. And I'll talk a little bit more about dialects in a little bit and how this interface in the system. But the important benefit of this ability to be able to mix and match in a single IR, oh, and by the way, it's, it's not actually something that's potentially that foreign to folks. If you think about in software, you have your packages, and you can install different packages, and they work together, and you're able to pass data between them and do different optimizations. In hardware, an analogy may be towards like having IP blocks as well as generator libraries, which you can reuse and combine to create your solution, right? And so, this ability to mix and match is actually very important because one of the things it enables is it enables to avoid creating artificial boundaries. Now, 
MLIR, we want to enable building domain-specific IRs and representing problem domains. We want to do so by giving you the tools to be able to model your domain, reusable components, to lower it down. What you don't want to do is we don't want to force all things into one. We don't want to collapse the, the semantic domain into one, and that is just the way how we serve all, right? So again, we want to be able to do this without reinventing the wheel. This means you know, we, we do want to be able to abstract over different sections at different times. So we want to, but we want to be able to do so without forcing abstracting over and dropping semantics until desired. So we, 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 do, we don't want to have users lose information recovered later. Now, we often see that the, these diagrams of consolidating multiple different like front ends or offsets together into one. And I think importantly, it is normally a multidimensional problem. Like the, 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 the funnel for different considerations of the stack may not all be at the same time. And so one of the things MLIR does is we have different mechanisms to enable you to abstract over this. And so, for example, you do have ops, you have common ops, you have interfaces that you can use to, to say, like, well, I, like this op is, is loop-like. Only thing I need to do is loop-like behavior on it. So, you know, I don't care if there's four, five or seven different ops that implement it. I'm working on the interface. Uh, as well as different types that describe, you know, the, the interactions and the interfacing between all of these. And I think that that's quite powerful to be able to, to not collapse the semantic space until required. Now, MLIR does have a, a couple of core design principles. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on these. Uh, we, there's a, a full article from CGO 2021 which goes into, these, into a lot more detail and, and discuss you know, the rationale, the, uh, the, how this fits to, to the design, and all of these things that I think are, are quite important. But like, the three I sort of want to highlight here is like uh, parsimony, traceability, as well as progressivity. Now, under parsimony, you know, it is one where one of the goals is we, we, we don't want to just duplicate entities for, for the sake of duplication. You know, avoid introducing additional concepts or redundant concepts until it actually serves a value, or if unless it serves a value, I should say. So one of the rationales here is that we, you want to avoid making easy things incidentally complex. You know, so we want to have a small set of versatile concepts that can be extended for different domains rather than you know, very hard-coded ones that you know, we have to do multiple different variants of. Another one that's quite important is traceability. As I mentioned before, it's almost always easier to preserve information than to recover it. So we want to make it so that for multiple reasons, you can capture the user intent, user location, so when you have debugging and all these things that you can trace back to what the user gave you. So it, it enables a better user experience as well. And then we have progressivity. Uh, and so like a, a little bit paraphrasing, you know, premature lowering is the, is the predecessor of all evil. You know, so if you start lowering and you lose information that you actually need later on, now you're suddenly made a simple problem extremely difficult to recover. You, you, you have to start introducing very complicated analysis to be able to recover what you had. And there's a very another important part of this progressivity. You know, we talked about how it enables reuse and uh, all of these things and composability, that's the focus. But this also emphasizes the fact that the intermediate state during these transformations is actually an important state for the IR. This is the thing that actually enables these different things to be able to collaborate. Now, these design principles uh, sort of lead into different design requirements, you, you know, having everything be extensible, having very few building concepts, having them be reusable in different contexts, like the SSA form, you know, graph versus imperative, having different regions and blocks to model different op behavior, uh, you know, for traceability, having pervasive source locations, so like uh, locations attached to everything, having declarative definitions to be able to utilize different, um, quote-unquote, backends for some of these things. Uh, progressivity to enable supporting some high-level abstractions, lowering it down, you know, to be able to have these things collaborate and compose rather than creating these artificial boundaries, right? So, and I think all of these things sort of like fit together in, in, in like the MLR design. Um, and I should say like, well, how is MLR different? Well, in my mind, MLR is state-of-the-art compiled technology. It's not a common graph serialization format. I think that's one of the things that often it looks like it's just a way to represent multiple different graphs, JSON-esque in one. Uh, you know, I, I think there's nothing that actually 
tries to create this amount of collaboration and reuse. Uh, it's modular and extensible from the graph representations, functional representations, through to the optimizations, the flow analysis, the, to the code generation. Um, you have different building blocks to enable you to target your domain. You know, it, it's, it's not one where it is uh, fit in this box and it may work for you. It is, here are things to build your solution. Um, as I mean, it's, it's not opinionated. So in, in MLR enables you to choose the level of representation that is right for your device, right? So we have multiple different devices and I think the folks in this conference are probably working on very exciting ones additionally. Um, and you know, it, it's important to be able to target them efficiently to get the main benefit. And so we wanna make it so that MLR enables you to do that. Now, so stepping up, MLIR, if we can be that as a reusable compiler abstraction toolbox, uh, one of the things that's you know, often not mentioned is like IR and optimization design involves multiple trade-offs. As you're deciding between different formats for these uh, ops or control flow or all these things, uh, you're evaluating it and you're evaluating the fit. It's an iterative process. It is a constant learning experience. And I think one of the things that MLIR does here is, while it doesn't think for you, it actually enables iterating on this to find the abstractions and concepts that matches um, for your problem domain. So MLIR also allows mixing levels of abstractions with non-obvious compounding minutes. We have made dialect to dialect lowering easy, reusing dialects together, reusing paths together, um, and we can have an ops from a dialect can mix in the same IR, as I mentioned. So you can have a lowering from front-end dialect, dialect A to your target D, and this may skip B and C for, for, for uh, some of the ops, for all of the ops, for, you know, for many different paths. So this is actually important because this, this goes back to having no forced IR impedance mismatches. You have no large jump with heroics and difficult to debug semantics that you have to look at. You can have progressive lowering that is all simple, direct, to, to evaluate and verify. Uh, MLIR to avoid, you know, build your solution to avoid lowering too early and losing information. You know, as I said, you know, this actually gives you a fresh look at problems. You know, it, it enables you to avoid hard analysis and, you know, still provide the benefits that you need. Okay, so that was a little bit about like MLIR, the origin, um, but what's in the box? What is actually in MLIR? So uh, MLIR has many, many, many different things, and we're going to be looking at quite a few of them during the tutorial today. So you know, we have a couple of great speakers coming after this that will you know, dig into a lot more of the details. I'm going to focus on a couple of the very you know, basic sections here. Uh, you know, how do you define and model uh, operations? Operations are quite key in MLIR, as, as I'll, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Uh, you know, how do you define passes, transformations, patterns, uh, and talk a little bit about testing. So, uh, in particular, there's a couple of, there's a lot of things that we could cover. Um, for example, I'm not going to talk about some of the, the how you define uh, custom attributes and types. Uh, we have a couple, you have a new, nice new data flow analysis framework, you know, sparse and dense analysis, you know, and able to combine different ones and query information from one analysis type to another one. Um, it's also a big set of existing optimizations, analysis, dialects, you know, like uh, 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 the affine dialect with its, its more simplified polyhedral ex expansion form, SCF, which is structured control flow form, uh, LINALC, which is, you know, a, a very interesting like iteration domain, um, modeling and execution and cogen format. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting things and you'll hear, you know, quite a few of them during the day. Um, and there's a lot more on, on the websites, but I'm going to focus just on, on, on the basic sections uh, here. Um, and so, operations are quite core to MLR. I think that is one of the things that's the, one of the, the most used forms of modeling your given abstraction or your problem. And, and MLR provides a general system for creating and modeling operations. So uh, operations, as I mentioned, enable defining the level of abstractions as well as optimizations. So you know, like if we talked about like the ACF4, you know, uh, it's, it's an op. And it's an, actually, I find for even a better example because it constrains the operations in this region so that it's amenable to some of the polyhedral analysis. Now, there is very little things built in, in MLIR. 
So from functions to modules to for loops to conditionals to types, oh, actually types is a different one, but all the other ones are all just operations. There's no uh, privileged function op. There are just multiple different ops that can implement the function like interface. They can have the behavior that we normally expect from functions, but for different problem domains, function actually normally looks a little bit differently. And so instead of having like one and say, oh, well, you have to use this one, function is just an operation. It's an operation with a region with blocks. Those blocks have operations again. That's your function. Function has a symbol. Function is isolated from above. You know, it, it's composition of MLIR concepts enabling the definition as, of this operation. And as I mentioned, a user could have defined them just as does as well. And up to, in, in MLIR core, we have a few of these variants. Externally, in the different projects, we have a few of these variants. And as you're de developing, we actually we also have like operations need not even be defined. And so, if an operation is not defined, MLIR will just treat it conservatively. So you have this operation, MLIR doesn't know anything about it. Passes are written with the assumption that you have to be robust against these unknown operations. Um, and I think that's quite powerful, especially as you're developing a dialect and developing some of your abstractions. Now, you've seen a little bit of MLR syntax, and you're going to see it a lot more. So I, I thought I'd just give a little bit of what the syntax looks like in a nutshell. And excuse the little bit of the eye chart here. I'll, I'll go through all these in, in a section. Um, and I think also the other part about the syntax is it shows some of the concept of MLR. Now, I'm going to start off at the end. Locations. Every operation has a location. Locations allow for a, a rich set of different modeling, so you can have like file line column, you can have named locations as is common in some ML frameworks, you can have call stacks, you can have fused locations that show the origin of this operation as a composition of multiple different operations due to a pass, you know, so for traceability fact through. All of these operations, you have an op ID, so you have, for example, the, the, the morph op, in this case, in the dialect, in this my dialect, uh, you can name the results of the operation. Operations can have multiple results. So in this case, this operation returns two results. Uh, you have a list of attributes, which are effectively constant named arguments, so compile time known, you can query them wherever. And then we get to types. So in this case, we have an example of ut utilizing two different, you know, a couple of different dialect types. Like I said, you, you can have dialect types, a couple of the types in the built-in. And this is how you represent it in the op. Now, this is one format, and this is what is called sort of like the, the generic format. The dialects are also enabled to, to represent, uh, you know, pretty printed form. Um, and then that potentially helps them to, for example, for a given domain, make it more readable to some of the folks in the debugging dumps that are the MLIR textual files. Now, I've mentioned dialects quite a few times. Now, an MLIR dialect is a logical grouping uh, you could sort of think of it as a consistent collection of abstractions or a library. Every dialect consists of a prefix, you know, effectively like a namespace which says, uh, you know, to name the space of all the operations. You have operations, you have a, a, a list of custom types, uh, and for each operation you can define like verifiers. So you say this operation only works on floating point types, it only works on ranked tensors, all these things, you, you can add some of the, the semantics, you know, does it have side effects, is it able to be contentful or not? All of these things you can tag onto the op. As I mentioned, you can also add uh, custom parsers and printers, so that means like for a given domain, if there's a form that is more appealing and more readable to the user, you can use it. And so this actually makes MLR quite nice to write manually. Like, even though this is the debug texture format that is one-to-one -one with the in-memory IR representation, it is not terrible to, to look at. It's actually, you know, uh, quite nice to look at and debug and trace. Dialects can also have, like, different passes for analysis and transformations, as well as dialect conversions to and from it, if you think about, like, learning to it from a higher-level dialect, like a front-end, as well as to uh, converting down for cogen. Now, um, you know, if you define a dialect, there's, there's, uh, you, you have a couple of parts in like ODS. So ODS is a table gen backend called op definition spec. It's a way to, to, to specify some of the dialects. Um, and you can do, use this to define uh, custom types, attributes, uh, the, the operations themselves, 
hooks for, um, uh, you know, for, for like the folding and whatnot. Uh, but the dialects themselves, a lot of it is actually defined in C++. You know, things like how you want to do some of the, the custom printing and parsing. We have a declarative assembly format that you use for I think, almost most cases. But if you need to do something a little bit more extreme, it's in C++. If you want to register like dialect specific folding hooks, so in dialect X, if the folder is called, you know, invoke this interpreter behind the scenes, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then we define, you can define the operations themselves. And so here's an example of like one operation from the TF dialect. It has some constraints on what, what its operands and result types can be, on what valid attributes can be. You know, you can, for example, can specify constraints and say like, hey, this attribute has to be between N, you know, A and B values. Um, and you can also add documentation. You know, so in our, on the MLR website, the documentation for the dialects are, are all generated from the description in the ODS files, right? So this gives you the ability to, to have your, your definition, your verification, and your traits all together. So like, if I want to know what an op can support, I have, it's, it's easy for me to look it up. Now, I've sort of talked about this a little bit before, but you know, one of the nice things about ODS and op modeling in, in MLIR is the progressive disclosure aspect. Op modeling is a sliding scale. You can start with a, a, a basic definition of the op, with a conservative definition, and then refine it over time. Now, the goal is that the more you model the operation and its behavior, the better it is. So you start with the basic operation, the, the, the more you have exact verifications of what is valid for this operation, the better invariance you get, the, the, the smaller debugging you get, because now you can flag when, invalid, when, oper when a transformation is invalid much earlier. As you add side effects and you improve the modeling to say like on what resources it operates on, you can en you enable more optimizations, right? So you, you can you go from, oh, this has to run, this cannot be moved, and you can opt into more performance as you go. Um, and I think this is quite powerful, this ability to be able to opt into more performance, add like loop like interfaces for unrolling, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it just makes it very nice to be able to start small and, and incrementally get better performance and better results and better debugging experience as you go. Now, once you have your operations, you know, what now, right? You've, you've, you've modeled your operations, uh, it's in your dialect, it's there. Well, you wanna optimize your model. So this is, uh, for example, you can go and say, okay, like, hey, I wanna make the computation cycle faster. So I wanna write some algebraic simplifiers, you know, some things to, to identify common patterns for optimization. I may want to quantize my model, so I want to be able to go through and update some of the weights. I want to perhaps compress some operations. Oh, it was doing X, and eh, I can do A and B instead, and it uses less memory, maybe more inefficient. You know, so you want to be able to write all these passes. You may also want to be able to analyze your graph, right? So even before I get to Cogen, I want to have an idea of how much memory it will take to know if I can target my given device. Uh, <laughs> and then, you also want to be able to, to compile to different target architectures. You want to be able to, to, to lower to loops. You want to be able to target reference libraries, um, all of these things. And like I said, we, we have a, a nice talk about the cogent aspects right after this. Now, a lot of the passes you write will actually be a combination of, uh, of different patterns. And so, you know, in MLIR, we wanted to make it easy to have specified these patterns for optimization. And today we have I would say two and a half different ways of doing it. Um, one is some of the, the C++ patterns that is used quite a lot and allows for a little flexibility. Then we also have what's called the declarative rewrite specification. We have two forms of that. Um, one shown here is uh, the, the, the table gen form. I'll talk about it in, in, in the next slide, but it enables you to, to specify you know, equality of two operations under constraints. And so this is then used for the optimizations for the people patterns. Uh, and the goal with some of the declarative ones is specify simple patterns simply, right? If you have a simple pattern, we want to make it easy to express it. So it supports n by n patterns. Uh, we support constraints and operations, operands and attributes, uh, also dynamic predicates, and it also supports calling to native C++ through ODI right. Now, there was no assumption that this will cover all the cases. So there's always going to be a long tail. But our goal here with these was to make it easy to express the simple case simply. And I mentioned, well, 
the declarative rewrite rules, they, there's multiple different uh, front ends to it. So the, currently the most widely used one is the, the table gen based one. So you have the table gen DAC representing S expressions of source and target. You know, this is something that's widely used in LLVM backends. You know, you, you see equivalents from, of it in like GCC, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's a quiet taste still. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, there's a couple of feeling folks that it just doesn't have a natural fit for them. But it is intended to keep the, the simple case simple. So its simplicity is actually a benefit here. But we're also working on PDL. Now, PDL is, is a lower level transformation bytecode. It's something that effectively describes the transformation that the rewriter would have to do. And on top of this, we are layering PDLL. PDLL is the language to tar target PDL. Um, for this, you know, it's a new front end. It, it's, it's, uh, it's declarative. It's, it's a I think better error semantics, we're, we've built a, a language server for it. So as you're writing your transformations, you get suggestions for which operation, you know, for the attributes you can match on, for constraints you can have. Um, and, you know, so I think that's very going to be very nice. Unfortunately, this is not an animation isn't working. I was going to show off a little bit about how the, uh, the, the LSP works. But, you know, feel free to go look on the, the VS Code extensions, MLR VS Code extensions web page for, for this. Um, some other folks have also written some Python that, that generates PDLL, and well, others have even generated YAML. So I think there's quite a few of these declarative rewrite front ends that we're working on, with the table gen and the PDLL one being the main ones. Okay, uh, with this, oftentimes you'll combine the different patterns into a pass. Here's an example of a pass that you've written. You know, uh, you, you specify a name for it, the kind of operations it, it operates on, you document it. You can specify, you know, the different flags to it, different statistics that will be collected, and from this we try and generate the majority of the the boilerplate that you need to define the pass. Now, of course, post this generation, the, the actual uh, writing of the pass happens in C++. This could be, you know, writing everything from scratch in C++ as normal, you know, walkers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or by utilizing some of the generated patterns from the different uh, DRR front ends. Uh, patterns, themse patterns and passes themselves, one tests using pass drivers. This is the op tool. You know, this is one of the things which is sort of like fundamental to, to MLIR's testing methodology. Uh, it's something that's normally on a per project level. Uh, it's pretty easy to add a new top level driver. And it's actually super useful in terms of like the debugging, verifying the front and back. As I mentioned, LVM, uh, sorry, MLIR, IR, the, the texture format is one to one to in memory. So you can dump it at any given point and rerun it through the tool to see exactly what a given pass did on this, uh, and dash debug as well to give you some more information. So uh, it, it's a it's, you know, very useful tool. And this actually it also sort of feeds into to how we test it. And so for example, as you're developing your pass and all these things, in some cases, you know, I, I'd work in a collab. You know, in the collab, iterate on it, get some results, get some results, play around with it, see if the pass does what I do. So very interactive. But this same interaction sort of leads into the final unit test where I try and in validate the invariance of the transformation. Now, a lot more on this, and I think you, you, we'll hear a lot more further details, but I sort of just want to make a plug for getting involved. You know, like I mentioned, MLR is open community. I think one of the important takeaways we had from looking internally initially and then externally in multiple different conferences uh, is that we're all solving similar problems over and over again. Right, so in compiles for machine learning, for example, at the workshop, it was a case of where we found like so many different companies had all re-implemented the same thing, and we're all trying to implement the step just after. So a lot of time was spent on these common and very important things, but a lot of these things are not the things that that were the value add that these groups are working on. And so with MLIR, we wanted to make it an open community where folks can collaborate and focus on the value add part. So open source side, a very active community, you know, please go to the forum and the chat and submit code and yeah, please get involved. Thank you. If you have questions, we would love for you to go on to Slack and to, uh, to enter your questions there and we'll try to answer as many of them live as we, uh, as we can. So we have time for. Uh, the first question is uh, about parsimony. Um, so you, you, you talked about how you wanted to keep the set of core concepts very small. Um, and yet, there seems to be really a tension between the, 
the desire to have a very small number of core concepts and yet this idea of extensibility and, and having lots of different dialects. So when you were designing MLIR, how did you really make that decision? Uh, how, how did you decide what to, what to put in the core infrastructure, what concepts and, and what concepts to leave to, to dialects? Like you were talking about how functions were, were something that you left to a dialect. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of tension between these, especially as you go to, to um, you know, uh, have different front ends, multiple front ends, and multiple back ends, and they have different requirements. Uh, I, I don't think there was, a, a, you know, like a silver bullet. I, I think, you know, we, we started off, um, and I think it's a case where we, we iterate quite often. Right, so like a function did start off as semi-hard coded, right? It, it was, a little bit more bolting than we wanted to do. We, we had to rip it out. It was a little bit, you know, of a pain. Uh, but I, I think that the, the the question we constantly ask ourselves is: Is this abstraction actually paying its due? Right? Like you have this. Should it be in a privileged spot? Yes or no? Uh, and you know, what can we do so that it we don't constrain people? Um, I think function was a great example of this one. Like I think uh, you know we, we've removed fun function as being Hard as as being the thing in quite a few places, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's 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 definitely tension there, and it's it's one where the goal at least is to have the system be extensible. Um, we have some folks that almost don't touch any of the downstream concept; they just use MLIR as you know, like the, the toolbox. Well, actually, <laughs> as the, the, the boulder of their dialects, but you know, don't reuse almost any of the concepts. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that's sort of a good sign that it's that extensible. Of, of course, we would love it so that we can collaborate as well, so that it's, you know, if there is something combined, that it is actually useful upstream. Yeah, that kind of starts to touch on the community aspects of how MLIR works. Maybe you can say a little bit about how the community process uh, sort of decides what are the core concepts and uh, maybe what dialects get accepted upstream versus what uh, dialects live uh, live downstream or live out of tree. Yeah, and I, I think this is, this is one of those where there's, uh, the, one of the good things is we have a lot of different folks with a lot of strong opinions in, in the area, which normally means, uh, you know, it's, it's a very active discussion. And I mean, we have one at the moment, I think that's going on very actively. Uh, so I, I think it's often a consideration of like, how does it fit, right? So we we have and uh, Suraj is going to show a uh, sorry Harsh is going to show a really nice diagram of some of the interops between like different dialects, and then the question becomes like well you have a, you have a new dialect you want to propose, how does it fit? What's the new thing that it adds? You know what is the value that it brings that is something that is generally useful to people, right? So um, if this is only of, of value to like one group, uh, you know perhaps they should keep it themselves. I, I think another aspect as well is, is you know, how tight it is to, to give an infrastructure. And so I'll give an example of like the TF dialect. You know, like uh, back when we were in, in, in the TensorFlow team, and it would have been very convenient for us to have the TF dialect upstream. But there's a lot of things that are linked with it, right? So you have importing from Savebill, you have importing from Graphdiff, you have you know verification with the 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 uh, uh, the eager execution runtime, all these things. Those things did not make sense in, in MLIR itself, right? So it, it became a case of like this, they don't fit within, um, they are too tied to a framework. Um, so I think that's often a different consideration. It's like just what else is needed to make this uh, a usable component? Yeah. I mean, that's a case where I think there's definitely been a uh, emphasis in what's upstream and in things that are very quite generic. And, and aren't really uh, sort of trying to to avoid having a lot of the the nasty details <laughs> uh, that that are necessary for some of the downstream frameworks or or, or up the machine learning frameworks or or downstream backends, um, while still having enough of a core that that you can actually put it together and have it do do interesting things, right? Yeah. Some uh, a lot of times those those nitty gritty details are sort of where the value is when when you have a, a big framework like this. Yep. So that maybe that leads into another question. Uh, so what are the uh, where do where do you see the big uh, gaps right now? Um, you know, I, I, wh where are the places that there's a lot of active development or active thinking in the MLIR community? Uh, yeah, I, I think 
I'm going to be a little uh, probably biased in my answer. I think there's there's a, there's a, a couple of areas of, of quite interest. I mean, one of them is towards, um, I mean, given the discussion has more than a thousand views and it's been going on for a couple of weeks, you know, it's, it's like a concept of a little higher level ops, you know, and, and high level is, is a vaguely defined concept here, but, you know, sort of a, a common entry set for cogen that's reusable and that's targeted towards uh, cogen. I, I think it, it's one where I feel a lot of different companies are feeling a pain or, or a need and, you know, there's active discussion. Um, you know, I think that that's sort of one area and I, 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 I don't think folks, I mean, I think there's also opposite where there's a couple of folks that believe that that's the ops like that is wrong. Like you shouldn't have ops like that. They actually constrain what you can do. You know, you want the more general concepts in, in there. Um, so I think that that's one area. Uh, the, the the area which is a little bit fun, but just actually coming closely, is bytecode. You know, so like having a stable serialization format that can be passed around, that's cheap and all. I think that's a very there's a, there's a code under review. I think that's an, a really nice thing for me. I'm very excited about that deployment wise. Um, I, I would say analysis. You know, the the dense and sparse data flow analysis frameworks came to be pretty recently. Um, we've used them in a couple of different places, but uh, I, f I think there's a lot of pain points I see where people are trying to work around this lack of like, this analysis and being able to query them and being able to mark them as retained um, that I think is being worked around in ways that uh, will harm later. Uh, and so, you know, coming back to like one of the things we, we, we said, like we don't want MLIR to be like LVM IR where people try to shove things into metadata attributes or debugging attributes that are load bearing, um, and I think that's that, that's another active area. But uh, and definitely my other other one is like given the diversity of, of hardware backends, uh, you know, it's a it's a good question. Like, what common abstractions are there for some of these accelerators? Right? It it, it feels like we are uh, scratching the surface in terms of commonality there. You know, like a lot of things still talk like LVM, and you know, it, it's it's focused. LVM's focus is specific, right? And it does a great job for, for what it's want to do. But some of these accelerators, it's not a good fit. Yeah. And I and I think there's there's a lot of pain at the moment of like uh, there's there's this missing abstraction a little bit lower down in the target level that I I, yeah, I, I don't know I don't think there's any work upstream about it at the moment. But I I, I think that that is a very exciting area yeah. as well. Well, that actually that's a great segue into our our next uh, speaker. So uh, thanks a lot, Jacques. We very much appreciate having you here, and I uh, think we're going to transition to our next speaker. So uh, Harsh Menon is the CTO at Nod.ai, and he works mostly on accelerating machine learning and data analytics workloads using uh, various aspects of code generation. So you're, uh, uh, Harsh is a great person to, to talk about that. Um, he's been with Nod.ai since its inception and uh, focuses primarily on MLIR and LLVM and uh, looking at new architectures. So. Thank you, Steve. Love to hear what you have to say, Harsh. Of course. Thanks, everybody. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here and present at uh, Hot Chips. Today, we're going to be talking about code generation in MLIR. I'll just give you a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. I'll start with a little bit of motivation about why code generation in MLIR is important. Then we'll talk about some of the differences between code generation in LVM and MLIR. And uh, then we'll walk through the different dialects uh, that are involved in code generation, uh, such as the Linal dialect and, and vector dialect and so on and so forth. So Jacques gave a very good introduction to MLIR. He briefly mentioned on some of these topics. Uh, now we'll get a chance to dive into them in a little bit more detail. After that, we will go through the walkthrough of a uh, perceptron example. And we'll focus on code generation, specifically the CPU and GPU code generation pipelines. Then we'll talk a little bit about custom accelerators as well as auto tuning. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so as you're all aware, deep learning is prevalent all around us on a wide range of topics. Everything from self-driving cars to medical imaging to natural language processing, deep learning is everywhere. Right? When I think about deep learning, I think of it existing in two separate realms. On the one side, you have these large language models, these gigantic models that train for months and cost millions of dollars to train. 
And on the other side, you have these extremely tiny models, more in the tiny ML range, where you're very resource constrained and where your metrics of interest might be more along the lines of latency or power efficiency. Now, both these realms are important, and hardware vendors uh, here at Hot Chips and beyond are stepping up to the occasion and coming up with a variety of different kinds of hardware architectures and chips, and you'll hear about this more in the upcoming days, how they are designing and improving their hardware to get that special efficiency that's required for ML applications. So with this Cambrian explosion of hardware architectures, the question is how can we empower the ML researchers to get the maximum efficiency? And to do that, well, we need to have a strong compiler infrastructure, one that can target, be retargetable and target all these different hardwares, and at the same time, one that bridges the gap and between what the ML researchers are writing, their high-level Pythonic neural network models, and what's actually, actually executed on the device. LVM is a great compiler infrastructure for this particular use case. It already supports targeting a wide variety of backends ranging from x86 to ARM, NVIDIA, and beyond. But the problem with LVM is that it's a little too level, low level, and so many opportunities for optimization are missed when you start approaching things or starting approaching things at this low level. MLIR enters here and tries to fill this missing infrastructure gap, the gap between the high-level representations of neural networks and models and LVMIR. So machine learning researchers implement all of their programs in high-level machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, JAX, and beyond. MLIR helps progressively lower that computation graph onto something that can be executed efficiently on device. So let's now talk a little bit about code generation in LVM, and then we'll talk about how that's a little bit different from code generation in MLIR. So when you think about code generation in LVM, it's the final phase in your compiler pipeline. You're thinking typically about issues such as register allocation, instruction scheduling, instruction ordering, and these kind of problems LVM is very good at and has demonstrated that by over the course of decades, right? So LVM has a backend, and in each backend it has table gen files that define the instructions for that particular hardware, as well as the mechanism by which you can take the LVMIR graph, lower it to the selection DAG, and then eventually take it to the machine instruction, MC inst, and finally to bitcode. So this pipeline as it exists, this LVM code generation pipeline is leveraged by MLIR. It's not replaced by MLIR, it's just leveraged by it. MLIR starts with the high level representation and then brings it down to LVMIR. In fact, it has an LVMIR dialect and that maps one-to-one -one with LVMIR. So that's how MLIR fits into this ecosystem. So now let's talk a little bit about code generation in MLIR. On the right, you can see this diagram, this busy diagram, which represents all the different dialects that are present in MLIR. As Jack just mentioned, a dialect is, you know, this level of abstraction. So if you look at this graph, I think there's a couple of takeaways from here. First, uh, there's many different ways to get from the top to the bottom. At the very top, you have things like TensorFlow and PyTorch. These are the machine learning frameworks. And as you get lower and lower down in this graph, you start approaching vendor-specific dialects, such as ARM, x86, NVIDIA. So there are many different ways to go from the high-level representation, the tensor immutable representation, to memrefs, which are actually have a representation in physical memory. At the high level, when you're dealing with these high-level dialects like uh, PyTorch A10 or TF Lite or Onyx, you're dealing with high-level optimizations. There no knowledge of the machine specifically, just mathematical optimizations such as you know, maybe two transposes canceling each other. Whereas when you get to the bottom, you start end up, end up doing low-level optimizations that are very hardware specific. And as I mentioned, once we reach LVMIR, we hand off to the LVM code generation pipeline to take us to the final binary. So now that we have an idea of how code generation MLIR works, how code generation LVM works, where these two fit in, let's talk a little bit about the different dialects that are involved in this process. And the very first dialect is the Linal dialect, linear algebra. So the linear the Linal dialect is used to represent perfectly nested loop computations, making it easy to do transformations such as tiling, fusion, and loop interchange. It operates on both the high-level immutable tensor representation as well as the memref uh, data type. 
It can be lowered to loops or affine expressions and incorporates learnings from several other ML compiler frameworks such as tensor comprehensions, halide, uh, TVM, and so on and so forth. So the, the core concept behind LinAlg is when you start in these high-level TensorFlow uh, machine learning frameworks, you have thousands of ops. And what LinAlg does is it decomposes this large surface area of ops into a much smaller surface area of ops, which are these LinAlg core ops, such as matrix multiplication and convolution. The advantage of doing this is first, these ops are modular and composable, and second, since they are a smaller set, it's easier for the compiler to just focus on optimizing the small set of ops. And the core workhorse of the LinAlg dialect is this op, which is known as the LinAlg generic op. And all the ops are represented, are actually represented as LinAlg generic ops. So let's go into the details of the LinAlg generic op on the next slide. So here, on the top right, you can see how the LinAlg generic is represented in IR. And on the bottom right, you can see the C pseudocode equivalent of this LinAlg generic op. So there are four defining attributes of a LinAlg op the indexing maps, the iterator types, the inputs and outputs, and the compute payload. So let's start with the indexing map. So here you can see in this example there are two indexing maps. The first one is an identity mapping because it takes the four induction variables, d0, d1, d2, d3, to the same. And the second one is takes uh, d0, d1, d2, d3 to d0 and d1. So it, it captures the data access patterns of each operand, and on the, the domain is the iteration space, and the range is the operand's data space. Next, we have the iterator types, and there are two types of iterator types supported in LinAlg generic ops, which are parallel and reduction, and they represent the data dependencies that are present between iterations of the loop. In this particular case, we're taking a four-dimensional tensor and reducing it to a two-dimensional tensor. So we have two of the different induction iterator types uh, represented as parallel, and the other two represented as reduction. Finally, we have inputs and outputs. So what you'll notice here is there are inputs, outputs, and results, and the outputs and results are actually tied to one another. And this has to do with shape information and the destination passing style, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to the bufferization content. Finally, the core of the, the body of the LinAlg generic is the compute payload, which is the operation that's performed at each point in the iteration space. In this case, it's an addition operation, the add f, which belongs to the arithmetic dialect. So we have the LinAlg dialect. We lower that down into the vector dialect, and that's the next dialect we'll talk about. The vector dialect provides a way to reason about n-dimensional vector abstractions. Still not hardware specific, but arbitrary n-dimensional vector abstractions. Now, LLVM cannot handle n-dimensional vectors, and so the vector dialect provides tools to take these n-dimensional quantities and reduce them to their one-dimensional equivalents. To give you a sense for some of the ops that are involved in vector dialect, you have things like vector transfer read and write, which help bridge the gap between memory and vectors and they can handle various different modes of operation, such as broadcasting and permutations. Another important op is a vector.autoproduct. Uh, the linalg.matmal operation is lowered to a vector.autoproduct, which eventually maps to the FMA instructions in LVMIR. After the vector dialect, we then lower to the GPU dialect. And the GPU dialect is present primarily in the GPU code generation pipeline, and it represents quantities of interest for SIMT devices. Some examples of operations that you will find in the GPU dialect are communication ops, such as all reduce, synchronization ops, like barrier, uh, and compute ops, like the matrix multiply accumulate op. Uh, right now, the GPU dialect only operates on memrefs. So, so far, we've kind of been vendor agnostic, but the next level, uh, and this is if you think about that initial graph that I showed you, we are going lower and lower down in the levels of abstraction. We started with the LinAlg dialect, we worked down to the vector, then we went to GPU, and now we're finally approaching vendor-specific dialects. So MLIR has a lot of vendor-specific dialects, uh, NVIDIA-specific, AMD-specific, ARM, Intel-specific, and each one of these dialects contains uh, vendor-specific ops, ops that are you will only find on that particular hardware. 
So for example, the NVVM dialect has the WMMA op, which you will not find in the AMD dialect, for example. So now let's talk a little bit about a code generation, and we'll walk through an example of this. Uh, but before we get into that, let me talk about the open source stack that we will be using to demonstrate code generation in MLIR. So ERI is an open source MLIR end-to-end -end compiler that can target both data center and edge workloads. It has support for a wide variety of machine learning frameworks, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, as well as a wide range of targets that it can support on the back end, such as NVIDIA, Intel, ARM, etc. So we will be using ERI to demonstrate it. And on the right, you can see a high-level picture of how this works. We'll get into more of the details later, but you know, we start with the frameworks and then eventually uh, progressively lower it down to the hardware IR. On top of ERI, we have Shark, and Shark is built on top of ERI, adds more CUDA performance optimizations, such as the caching allocator, asynchronous memory prefetch, it adds auto-tuning capabilities and backends for custom accelerators, and contains a fully validated set of hundreds of models that can be easily deployed on the NVIDIA Triton server. So here's the example. Uh, we will be working with the perceptron example, and a perceptron is essentially just matrix multiplication followed by a max operation, and the max is referred to as a ReLU in neural networks. So on the top right, you can see how this neural network would have been implemented if we were writing it in C or C++. And on the bottom right, you can see how this would be implemented if we were using a machine learning framework. In this particular case, it's uh, TensorFlow. So we have a matrix multiplication, which is you know, 64 by 1024 uh, times 1024, followed by a ReLU. So the first thing to note when you look at these two different images is that uh, in the machine learning framework, it's quite obvious what the operation is. Uh, there is a matmol there. And so just looking at that matmol, from a compiler perspective, we can already say that, hey, I really think that this matmol should be running on my fixed function matrix multiply unit, on my tensor core if I were using an NVIDIA uh, GPU. And so in order to do that, we can start to design our progressive lowering to take us in that particular direction. If you started at the C or C++ level, it's not quite obvious you know, that this is a matrix multiplication. And so without any kind of raising, you would have to do extra work. And so that's one of the key takeaways about this uh, code generation process starting from ML frameworks is uh, because of this semantics and the intent is obvious at the high level, it results in reduced complexity during tiling, fusion, and vectorization. So we start with this Pythonic representation of the computation graph. And the next thing we do is we lower it down to Linout to tensors. Uh, on the way, we stop in MHLO, which is an input dialect. And you'll hear more about that in the next talk, which is about front ends, ML front ends. And once we have that, we bring it to the Linout dialect. So on the right, you can see an example of what this IR looks like. And there's a couple of things I'd like to bring to your attention. First things, uh, first, you'll notice that we now have a linalc.matmol, and this represents the matmol computation that was present in the Pythonic representation. But uh, a little in, uh, details about this particular op, it's not just A times B, it's C plus equals A times B. So there's the accumulator uh, that's also present in this particular op. And as a result, we need to initialize the output to zeros prior to doing the matrix multiply. And this is why we get a linalc.fill right before the linalc.matmol. You can also see that the max operation has now been represented as a linalc generic. And since there are no reductions that are happening here, you see that the iterator types are parallel. Right? So here we have a matmol. As I mentioned, the sizes are 64 by 1024 multiplied by 1024 by 1024. So this is the starting point for our compiler. And now we'll go into the details of the CPU code generation pipeline. So the first step in the CPU code generation pipeline is we start with the neural network and we partition it into smaller subgraphs. And we're going to call these dispatch regions. Uh, after we do that, we're going to do a level of tiling and distribute it to work groups. And you can think of work groups as you know, virtual processors. Uh, we do additional levels of tiling and fusion, and then we do vectorization, and then eventually we bufferize and do an asynchronous dispatch. So some key components of this pipeline are tiling and uh, vectorization. We perform the bufferization after vectorization, so late in the pipeline. And at the very end, we start lowering things closer to the hardware that we are targeting by introducing hardware-specific information, like vector sizes, for example. Uh, 
And the other interesting thing to note about this is a lot of this pipeline is actually shared with the GPU side of things. And we'll get to that when we look at the GPU code generation pipeline. So let's start with uh, creating dispatch regions. So on the right, you can see the IR. I've kind of highlighted the body of the dispatch region. This is exactly what you saw before. But now it's contained inside a dispatch region in the flow dialect. And this is specific to Erie. So in this particular case, we have a small graph. And so we just have a single dispatch region. But if you had a larger neural network, you would probably have hundreds or, or more of these dispatch regions. Each dispatch region contains a root op. And this could be a Linalg named op or a Linalg generic op which is then fused with as many consumers as possible. Right? So this is the, where we do some kind of fusion. The second kind of fusion we do is we have, if we have a multiple of element-wise operations uh, that are linear generics, we can fuse them together here as well. So in this particular case, our uh, dispatch region contains the matrix multiplication as well as the element-wise operation that follows it. Next, we do a tiling and distribute to work group. So we partition the matrix multiply along the parallel dimensions, so the M and N dimensions. And so we're just operating on a tile of the data. What we do is uh, we, we distribute this to a three-dimensional grid of virtual processors uh, known as work groups. And this maps one-to-one -one with the three-dimensional uh, grid of cooperative thread arrays that you're familiar with from GPUs or can even be mapped to multi-core CPUs. We use a block cyclic distribution to distribute all the different tiles. And so you can think of each dispatch region operating on just a tile of the work. And the virtual processor identifies itself by its rank, which is denoted by the workgroup ID, as well as the number of processors. So let's take a look at what this IR looks like. And here you can see uh, we still have the Linac Matmal and the Linac Generic following it. But what you'll notice is that the MATML is not operating on the large matrix multiply. Now it's 32 times 1024 multiplied by 1024 times 32. So we've only done the tiling along the parallel dimensions, not along the reduction dimensions, which is why the reduction dimension remains large at 1024. You can see the introduction of the SCF.4 loops representing the two levels of tiling that have happened. Uh, you can also see workgroup ID X and Y which are kind of the equivalent of the rank of the virtual processor. So this concludes the first level of tiling that we do. We now do an additional level of tiling uh, along parallel dimensions. And here, we start to introduce sub-tensor operations, so operations that allow us to extract a slice of the tensor and then insert a slice into the tensor. Now, depending on kind of the tiling style sizes that we choose, they may not be one size that fits all. And so we have to do a little bit of analysis to determine whether the tensor is going to have a static shape, uh, here represented as you know, a tensor with fixed size, 32 times 128, or whether it's going to end up with a dynamic shape, which is referenced as a question mark, because uh, we might not know what that is. Something else that we can also do if we want to ensure that we have a certain fixed style size is uh, padding. And this is often done in the code generation pipeline as well. Next, we have another level of tiling. And in this particular case, uh, we do the single tiling expert, which just does the tiling along the reduction dimension. But depending on your processor, you might want to model the different levels of hierarchy, of uh, cache hierarchy. And so you have multiple different tiling experts that are present in Erie right now, such as the double tiling expert, the triple tiling expert, double tiling expert with padding and peeling, and so on and so forth. And any one of these, different ones of these, might be more applicable to your situation than other ones. So as a result of this tiling along the reduction dimension, now we end up with a matmal that is 8 by 16 times 16 by 32. So that concludes the level of tiling. And now we introduce the vector dialect, and we start to vectorize our IR. So on the right, you can see what this looks like. Some things I'd like to point out. The linac.matmal has now disappears and is now lowered to a vector.contract. So this is a contraction op. As you look at the contraction op, you might notice that it has a lot of similarities with the linac generic op. You know, you have the indexing maps, you have the iterator types, but now you have a new attribute, which is the kind attribute, which tells you what kind of contraction is happening. And here it's an addition because we're doing a matrix multiplying. In addition, you can see there's an insertion of vector.transfer read right above. Uh, 
and a vector drug transfer write at the very end after the element-wise operation. Also, you might notice that the Linux generic has been replaced by its arithmetic equivalent, but it's now operating on the vector data type and not the tensor data type. Next, we get into bufferization. And so in bufferization is guided by a couple of different principles. We really want to allocate and copy as little memory as possible. And we always prefer to use buffers in place, in place bufferization. And we use destination passing style as a heuristic to accomplish this. So the core idea behind destination passing style is that you know, the responsibility for allocation and deallocation doesn't lie with the function, but with the caller of the function. And so you can see, in, uh, this is what I mentioned to alluded to earlier in the slides, was that in the Linux generic op, you have an output tensor as well as a a results tensor that are kind of tied to one another, right? And so during bufferization, when we take this op that is present in operates on tensor types and we bufferize it, which means convert it to the operating on the member of types, then we look at that constraint and try and see, hey, can we just use that to bufferize? Or do we need to do an allocation? So every time we do bufferization, we do a future analysis to see whether there are going to be any read after write conflicts. Uh, if so, we do an allocation, otherwise we do an in-place bufferization. Now, in general, a global copy optimization approach might end up with better results, but this heuristic seems to work reasonably well. And finally, after bufferization, we now introduce more hardware-specific information, specifically you know, the vector sizes supported by the target. So we do vector unrolling, and we handle any other corner cases. Uh, the vector.contract you see is now replaced by a vector.outer product. And as I mentioned earlier, the vector.outer product eventually gets mapped down to the FMA instructions when you look at it in LVMIR. So that kind of summarizes the CPU code generation pipeline. Essentially, we took the graph, we broke it into subgraph dispatch regions, we did multiple levels of tiling, we did vectorization, and then we did uh, bufferization, and then we introduced more hardware-specific information. So let's talk a little bit about the GPU code generation pipeline for now. And on the right, you can see a high-level diagram of how the GPU code generation pipeline works. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that a lot of these blocks are similar or almost the same as the CPU side of things. We still create dispatch regions. We still tile and distribute to work groups. We still bufferize. Only this time we do bufferization before vectorization. Uh, this is something we would like to change, but that's how the pipeline is today. Uh, the other big difference is that in the GPU side, we're not going to focus on more GPU-specific concepts, such as how do we optimize shared memory transfers, and how do we emit appropriate intrinsics to target those tensor cores, because that's where we're really going to get that high performance that we're going after. So after you know, we create dispatch regions, we do the first level of tiling and distribute to work groups, the region where the GPU pipeline, pipeline separates from the CPU pipeline is now we do a tiling and distribute to warps. Right? Uh, and so what we do is we tile the reduction dimension, and we introduce these kind of uh, memrefs, memref.copies that represent the transfer of data from the host memory to the shared memory. So let me show you what the IR looks like uh, right here. So you can see that we have you know, the SCF.4. We are doing a reduction on the a tiling on the reduction dimension, followed by the insertion of the memref.copy. So the interesting thing about you know, the memref.copy is you know, it's right now as it stands, you know, it doesn't really have any GPU-specific semantics, right? It's just that during the process of lowering, we are going to assign a meaning to this memref.copy. We already have the intent to use this to represent transfers from host memory to shared memory, but this is an example of how in MLR you can use these generic concepts to model things and then specialize them in your pipeline as you target specific hardware. The other things I'd like to point out is you know, we have linux.matmol that's operating on a smaller size, and we're operating on all on memrefs because we did bufferization a little bit early in the GPU pipeline. So now let's talk a little bit about some GPU-specific optimizations. Uh, I won't be able to go over all of them, but just a few of them here should give you a flavor of what's possible with the GPU, with MLR code generation for GPUs. So the first thing here is an essential ingredient for pipelining. Essentially, it's multi-buffering. If you have any kind of buffers that are creating bottlenecks 
between the different iterations in your pipeline, that's that's not going to work. And so you can do double buffering or triple buffering, and there's a user setable parameter that allows you to do this uh, to enable pipelining. How this looks in the IR, uh, if you look at the top uh, box, you can see this is before multi-buffering. We had a memref that we allocated uh, that was being overridden to multiple times in the iteration. And on the bottom, what you see is we've increased the rank of that particular allocation. So now we've made four copies. So instead of having a 16 by 32, we have a 4 by 16 by 32. And when we're actually writing to it inside the iterations of the loop, we only write to a, a subview of the memref and not the entire memref. So this is the first optimization that we do on the GPU side of things. Next, uh, we do try to optimize those shared memory copies. We try to vectorize them. And so what you see here is that memref.copy has now gone away and is replaced by vector transfer reads and vector transfer writes into shared memory. Uh, based on experiments, we've determined that the optimal size uh, is to copy 128 bits at a time. And so we can use this as a constraint when deciding how to vectorize or the tile sizes for this operation. And we do unrolling as well to improve performance. Next, we'll talk about reducing bank conflicts. As you might be aware, a GPU memory is broken up into shared memory. Uh, that is, shared memory is broken up into banks. There are 32 banks, and each bank has about a width of four bytes. Now, each thread in a warp can access the shared memory in parallel. But if two threads try to access the same bank, then you end up with a conflict. You have both the accesses become serialized, as a result of which you get a slowdown. So in order to avoid these kind of bank conflicts, one effective strategy is to just apply padding. And so that's the current strategy. On the top box, you can see what is the uh, IR before we apply this uh, optimization, and on the bottom, the IR after. And you can see that we're padding, uh, our padding is aligned with 16 bytes. Uh, right now, this strategy of padding works, but it's a wasteful because we're just allocating memory that's not really being used. A more effective strategy would be to use shared memory swizzle, and that's in our roadmap in the upcoming quarters. Next, we start to do vectorization. But this is a little bit different from the vectorization that you saw from the CPU side of things. Because we know that we want this MATML to run on those tensor cores, we start to optimize the shape of these MATMLs to what is accepted by the tensor core, what the tensor core excels on. So we know the tensor cores work on MATMLs of the size 16 by 8. And so that's you can see that our MATML is now broken up into these different vector contraction ops. And each one has a size that is optimized for the tensor core. Also, you can see the vector transfer reads and writes have come right above the compute. And you can see that the element-wise op is reduced to its arithmetic equivalent. Next, and this is also different for the GPU pipeline, we focus on going to the GPU dialect. And so here you can see that a lot of the vector abstractions have been replaced with their GPU equivalents. So for one, the vector transfer read and write that we were using to model the shared memory copies have now been replaced by NVGPU dialect constructs, such as device async copy, create group, and weight. Uh, you can see that the vector.contractions that we had before in the CPU case eventually became vector.outer products, but in the GPU case, now they're becoming MMA computes. And this is exactly what we want. Similarly, the element-wise operations uh, go from being just arithmetic quantities to GPU L MMA element-wise operations. So this is how you can start to see how we take this these different IR constructs that are more general at the higher levels and start to specialize them slowly and surely to really target that device that we intend to, which in this case, those tensor cores. The next optimization we do is uh, GPU pipelining, and we do this using modulo scheduling. So I have a simple example of, to demonstrate how this works. On the right, you can see a for loop where we load the ith element of A, the i plus oneth element of A, we add them together, divide them by four, and store the result in B. So this is represented in the leftmost uh, image as the series of, bo of blocks. And you can see LD for load, ST for store, and plus and divide for the corresponding operations. In the middle, you can see what happens if we have a constraint, which is that we can do load and one load and store in parallel with some kind of compute. 
And what you see is that the initiation interval, which is you know, the time between consecutive iterations, is now in three in this case. And depending on constraints, this may change. So for example, if we have the ability to do two load and stores in parallel, now our initiation interval goes down to two. Right? And you can see that you really want to minimize the initiation interval to get that good performance. The other thing I'd like to point out is if you look at this particular image, you can see that it's broken up into three different, when you pipeline it, it's broken up into three different regions. So you have the region above the arrow, which is the prologue, and then you have the kernel, and then you have the epilogue. And so this is exactly what we do with our code as well. We take that SCF for loop, we emit a prologue, kernel, and epilogue. You have the device uh, async copies occurring in the prologue, the actual kernel computation contains the MMA computes and any additional copies, and then the remainder of the computation is contained at the very end. So once we have the pipelining, we have all the optimizations that we have in place. There's a couple of optimizations that I didn't have a chance to get to, such as split K and work group swizzle, but we incorporate those as well. And then we convert it to LVM IR and with the appropriate intrinsics and bring it down to PTEC. And once we have it in PTEC, we use JIT compilation to convert the PTEC to the equivalent native GPU code. An alternative approach would be to use the assembler, convert into SAS, and then convert to a Cuban. On the right, you can see this is what the PTEC looks like. And really, when we start at the very high level, when we looked at that Python code and we said, hey, this is a matrix multiply, we really should be running it on our tensor cores. Well, now we've accomplished that, right? We have these WMMA ops that we were really going after. So far, I've just been talking about uh, GPU-based code generation focusing only on the NVIDIA side of things, but you know, this pipeline can also be extended to other hardwares that have similar functionality. So for example, AMD has the MFMA instructions that can be targeted, Intel has XMS instructions, and your accelerator may have other kinds of specific instructions that we can target. So that's a good segue into the next slide where we talk a little bit about targeting custom accelerators. Having seen the flow from the GPU pipeline, having seen the flow for the CPU pipeline, now let's talk a little bit about how we might reuse some of this flow and target custom accelerators. So there's a lot of buzz about some of these new accelerators. They usually end up using uh, RISC-V-based many-core architectures. An example of an open source one is Hammerblade. Uh, and you can see an image of that to the right. So you have uh, all these different processing elements and they're connected to some kind of RISC-V cores that may have scalar and or vector functionality. And so how do we approach this problem? What do we need to do to use this code generation path and you know, get that performance on our accelerators? And you know, the good thing about MLIR is you know, with code generation and reusability, we can leverage a lot of the higher parts of the stack. Going back to that figure I showed before, at the very top, you're going to start with TensorFlow, you're going to start with JAX, you're going to br bring it down through Linalg and maybe have a vector abstraction. And somewhere down there, you're going to think about having a, a new dialect that models the specifics of your particular accelerator. What is unique about your accelerator? Is it, how do we model the memory hierarchy? How do we handle, model any kind of special fixed function um, hardware that you have, right? So that's some of the things that we can do by creating a new dialect. And we've done this multiple times at NOT. Uh, the next thing we can do is if we have really focused on RISC-V based code generation, well, we can leverage LVM's existing RISC-V backend. MLIR also has an experimental RVV dialect, and that can also be used for this particular task. Uh, but this is just one piece of the puzzle. It allows you to figure out how you know, we can bring it down and target these custom accelerators. There's also some other things to think about, which is how best do we distribute the computation along this huge grid of processing elements? Is there a cost model we can use? And uh, how do we use the cost model? How do we determine optimal parameters and so on and so forth? How do we best split the computation between any kind of, between the RISC-V uh, chip and this many, and these different processing elements, right? So these are all questions that need to be answered. And this kind of leads naturally to a discussion about auto-tuning. So, so far, you know, when I've talked about, I showed you the code generation pipeline, I you know, talked about tiling, I talked about vectorization, but what I glossed over was 
And what's the tile size? What's an optimal tile size? What's the optimal interchange? And how much should I unroll the loop? Right? These kind of questions I didn't really answer. And um, just to give you a flavor of what's possible with auto-tuning, on the right, you can see the performance um, on uh, NVIDIA A100 of inference of a, of a, of a mini LM model. And um, on the right most, you can see uh, Shark uses auto-tuning. And right before that, you can see Google Eerie. And so you can see the code generation gets us quite far, and then auto-tuning adds a little bit more extra performance to our model. So the way to think about these kind of uh, problems is to really formulate it as a search problem. And there are three components to every search problem. The first of which is, what is going to be your search space? How do you define the search space? So sure, you might say, well, tile sizes are a good search space for me. That's great, but then what are valid values of the tile size. Maybe not all values are valid. And so these are some things that you need to determine when you're defining your search space. The next thing you need to do is define what is going to be your metric. What are you trying to optimize? Uh, is it going to be a throughput? Is it going to be latency, power efficiency, or some combination thereof? So that's another thing that we need to look at. And then uh, you will think about the search strategy. How am I going to go about minimizing the metric of interest on the search space that I've defined? And there are many different ways of doing this, examples of which are reinforcement learning, genetic algorithms, et cetera. So some, there are many frameworks out there that can accomplish this. And I'll just reference a few of them here. Uh, first of them is uh, Compiler Jim, which is uh, based on OpenAI's Jim. It's a reinforcement learning based framework for compiler based tasks. And so the whole idea is you define your environment of interest and you have an action space which defines the different actions that you can perform. And when you perform an action in the environment, you know, you observe something, you get a reward, and then you iterate on this until you get an improvement in the performance metric that you're looking at. So on the right, you can see an image of uh, this. We've used Compiler Gym, and this is an MLIR matrix multiplication example where we were trying to optimize the performance of matrix multiply. And you can see we were able to accomplish some improvement in overall performance. Another example of a framework that can be used is, and has been used to improve uh, performance, is Nevergrad. And you know, one thing I'd like to point out here is that you know, the reason why we're using these kind of frameworks and not the typical traditional deep learning frameworks is because we don't have gradients availability. Differentiability is not something that is available for these tasks. Not all of them are differentiable. So unlike the neural network regime where everything's differentiable, uh, or mostly everything's differentiable, here, and mostly everything is non-differentiable, right? So we have to think about different ways of approaching these problems. On the bottom right, you can see that we have a table that contains a list of all the different knobs that are available for code generation. Things like tile sizes, interchange, pad, uh, vector uh, contraction lowering, and, and so on and so forth. So these are, not all of them are uh, discrete, but some might be Boolean values. And so we have to figure out a way to handle these. The other thing I'd like to point out is, you know, so far I've just been concentrating on a single op, and our example was designed to be a single op, a simple uh, example. But when you look at a larger neural network, a lot more questions arise. Well, your search space expands because you have a larger network and you have more ops, but you also inherit new kinds of problems, such as, well, how do I best partition these graphs? Uh, you know, you have concepts such as inter-operator parallelism, uh, you know, or like model parallelism, data parallelism, pipeline parallelism, right? These are new problems that you inherit. And the question is, well, how do we handle that? And here I'd just like to reference another framework, ALPA, which has been able to cast some of these problems as an ILP problem and get some good results on it. So these frameworks provide some uh, a starting point for us to you know, start solving these problems on our custom accelerators. So to conclude, uh, I'd like to say that MLIR code generation really focuses on taking those high-level tensor computation primitives and lowering them to LVMIR with appropriate intrinsics for the task. The goal is, you know, when we look at that math model, we knew that that you know, really should be running that on our tensor core. So we want to take the guesswork out of the LVM back, and we do not want to rely on a vectorizer to generate specific instructions that you know we that we are out of our control. We would like to do that, and MLIR provides a way to do that because of its progressively lowering abstraction mechanism.
We still, at the same point, we do want to leverage LVM. We do not want to be doing register allocation all over again. So we definitely do want to leverage LVM's code generation pipeline. So these two pipelines work in concert and complement each other in many different ways. The other interesting thing about code generation pipelines was that a lot of concepts were shared between the CPU and GPU side, and this is usually not the case, and can also be shared with your custom accelerators. Tiling and vectorization were key components of both these pipelines, and on the GPU side of things, we really needed to do a little bit more work because we had to handle those additional GPU concepts, such as shared memory and targeting the tensor cores. And finally, you really need auto-tuning to go from your vanilla performance to get that peak performance on your hardware. So it's important to invest in that framework, carefully define the search space, and make sure that you are making good progress on that. So far in this entire talk, I've only had the time to talk on perfectly nested computations. I've only had the time to talk about um, dense tensors, but MLIR is, is much more than that, right? And MLIR has support for sparse tensors as well. You don't, you're not restricted to just MATMLs and convolutions. You can do other kind of ops, like scans, and this is handled by another dialect, such as the Linalg X dialect. So, you know, we can talk about more of this uh, later at another time, but I just wanted you to know that MLIR does have all of these different capabilities. Uh, I, all of this work would not have been possible without the contributions of a strong community. And you know, I'd like to give a shout out to the Nod AI team and the Google ERI team for making this possible. We would love to chat with you if you have any more questions, comments, uh, beyond what's on Slack. Feel free to get in touch with us. We're always online on these Discord channels here and would love to get in touch with you. And here are some references if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Harsh. Thank uh, you. That was a really great talk. Thanks. Uh, we have a, a few questions for you. Um, one, I guess, uh, you talked a little bit about the sort of coarse-grained array kind of accelerator. I wonder if you can say a little bit of maybe about fine-grained accelerators. Is that something that you've looked at? And maybe what concepts in MLAR would you use to do implement code generation for a fine-grained uh, spatial uh, accelerator array? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So yes, we, we've looked at uh, many different kind of accelerators. Uh, we've worked with many different companies on this process, and every company has you know, a unique way of kind of defining their architecture. Uh, so the, what we found is, our, or at least our guiding principle, is to really leverage as much as possible the existing infrastructure that's present in MLIR before inventing something that is you know, very specific to their hardware. Right, so there's a lot of concepts that we found useful. Uh, I mean, at the higher levels, Linalg is a great starting point. The vector dialect is you know, a good way to represent you know, these um, hardware agnostic vector abstractions. And uh, you know, the GPU dialect may or may not actually be that applicable. I guess it, it really depends. But you, know, you might want to stop at the vector dialect or Linalg dialect uh, and then introduce some of your more uh, hardware-specific concepts, specifically the memory hierarchy. We've seen that you know, different accelerators tend to have very unique uh, kinds of uh, memory hierarchies. And so that's something that we really found that's an important model. And we can start doing that at a high level using memref-based ops, but eventually we very quickly have to go down into hardware-specific abstractions. Yeah, definitely. I think how, how data moves around between different levels of the memory hierarchy and is, is often really important in a lot of these accelerators because they're not built so much around, uh, you know, processors that have cache hierarchies. That you, you know, for these, you know, if you're doing implementing matrix multiply or convolution, the caches don't necessarily help you. Or if you have compiler minute scratch pads, then then I imagine there's a lot of uh, complexity there in, in how you handle that for for a lot of different kind of architectures. That's definitely something that we've seen. So uh, you also talked uh, a little bit about sparse code generation. Maybe you can point people to where the, the sparse code generation work is happening in the community. What are the projects that people should go, go look at if they're particularly interested in sparse kind of applications? Yeah, so that, that's a very exciting field. And there's a lot of interesting work uh, being done there, headed by some folks at Google. I'll call out Art specifically, who's kind of been spearheading some of this effort. So there's a publication that uh, I think would be very interesting to people who are interested in sparse sensors. Uh, out in the academic community, you have things like Tasso, 
uh, you know, which really set the standard for sparse based computations. And so we have an implementation of that in MLIR as well. You have a sparse, specific sparse dialects that are present that I would point people to. And there are many different tests within the code base that showcase this functionality. So I would say that would be a very good starting point as well as the publication to get a little bit of sense for what was the theoretical backing and understanding uh, of that approach. Um, and you, you definitely talked a little bit about how MLIR and LLVM work together. Um, maybe you can say a little bit more about what the pieces are of the code generation pipeline that work well in MLIR versus the parts that work better in LLVM. Uh, yeah. and, and similarly, you know, what are the parts in LLVM that are, would be very challenging to implement uh, if you were trying to build an LLVM but are much easier to do at, at a higher level of abstraction in MLIR? That's a great question, and you know, in fact, I've had uh, a chat about this with uh, some of my colleagues. You know, we, some people have this feeling that you know MLIR should be uh, you know everything, and so they're actually trying to re-implement parts of LVM and MLIR, right? So you know, the, there are a lot of advantages to MLIR, like Jock talked about. You know, these progressive levels, progressing, progressively lowering things. Uh, you know, all the location tracking, error handling, the passes, the infrastructure, the dialects. I mean, that, that's huge, right? Uh, even the handling of the, not having any kind of fee nodes, right? There's, there's a lot of differences between LVM and MLIR. But, you know, that, personally, I, I don't hold that opinion. I think, you know, they're, they both excel in different areas. And so from the MLIR perspective, um, you know, the good thing, like I mentioned, is, you know, we can see we're starting from a framework where it's obvious what the intent is. And so we have this nice infrastructure which allows us to easily target retarget actually uh, different uh, hardware. So we can take this Pythonic graph and deploy it on uh, AMD GPU, deploy it on, uh, you know, Intel, uh, uh, all these different things. The thing that I like about it is, you know, that these abstractions have been designed very nicely. You know, the Linalg abstraction, for example, uh, has captures the essence of what's required to do tiling, vectorization, and fusion. Uh, the GPU dialect, for example, captures, you know, the things that you need for SIMT side of things. The vector dialect captures all of that. So I think those things it does quite nicely. And um, in terms of the optimizations that you can do in MLIR, absolutely. There's you know, all these kind of higher level optimizations that would not be possible in LVM. And I think Jock referred to this earlier on as well. The lower down the stack you go, the you're losing on a lot of information. And when you lose that information, you lose on opportunities to optimize based on that information, right? So you know, something as simple as A transpose transpose equals A, would be very difficult to do when you're operating at things in the LVMIR level, right? So I think that's that's really where MLIR excels, and so it's found a nice spot for itself. And uh, in terms of what LVM does very well, I mean, you know, if you look at a definition, the hardware definition, that's contained entirely in LVM, right? You have this. Uh, every backend has, you know, these stable gen files. You have this nice way of defining instructors instructions uh, that are specific to the backend. You have you know, the selection DAG mechanism, you know, these are things that I think uh, would be difficult to replicate in MLIR. I mean, it's battle tested, it's been proved, proven across many different architectures. So uh, you know, I think LVM does that very well. I, I do think that there would be you know, something interesting where you know, if you could have more of MLIR in, in LVM would be an interesting uh, thing place to go, but you know, I, I'm not sure where that's gonna go. Yeah, well, I, I think definitely that's still something where the community is trying to figure out how, how to how to balance the two, right? And I think definitely a lot of people in the LLVM community are are very supportive of MLIR and trying to figure out how to leverage what's in MLIR uh, for for you know sort of a broader, broader class of applications in addition to just in addition to machine learning. Um, so you, you talked uh, mentioned auto tuning at the end, um, and I think that's a place where. Uh, today, in in a lot of the MLIR examples, that these are sort of built by hand, right? So the the transformation lowerings are there, uh, but deciding what transformations to to make isn't isn't there. Um, and it sounds like uh, definitely Nod.ai has some interesting code there. I was wondering if you can say a little bit about what the the plan. Is is to perhaps open source that, or how do we get this auto-tuning capability into, uh, into MLIR? Yeah, absolutely, and we are all for open sourcing uh, that technology. Uh, as I said, you know, this is a, a community-driven effort, and you know, we all kind of raise each other's ships, so you know, we're all in this together and trying to get you know, MLIR to be as performant as possible. 
so as far as uh, code generation and auto tuning capabilities are concerned, you know, some of the references, uh, the frameworks that I've referenced are in fact completely open source. So Compiler Gym is open source. We have created an MLIR based environment for matrix multiplication, which has also been open source. So we work closely with Chris and Hugh and other folks there, and you know they've been very receptive to incorporating MLIR there and showcasing how it works. Um, that being said, you know we don't want to be necessarily tied down to just one framework. You know, uh, we, uh, we there's NeverGrad and there's other tools and so on and so forth. Uh, so. I think, as I mentioned, there's a, a couple of things that need to be defined for auto-tuning. Those three things, if you go back to the search space, the search uh, metric, and kind of the search strategy, right? Uh, and so the, I think one of the things, important things that's often overlooked is that really that definition of the search space is important. That search space can get exponential in a hurry, right? And so it's very important to have those kind of constraints in place, and those constraints um, I mean, I, I guess you could search for them. That would take a very long time, but uh, that usually comes in from kind of intimate knowledge that you have with the hardware or you know, uh, other kind of experiments that you've run. So it's important to really constrain that space, and I feel that's something that maybe we can all contribute to, and, and as these new hardwares come in, we should have a place where we can formalize these constraints so that when the community is doing auto-tuning, you know, it leverages the constraints, constraints to really reduce the size of that search space. Uh, so that's one aspect to it. The other part is as far as the search algorithms are concerned. Um, and I think this is an interesting area. Uh, you can, luckily, all the frameworks that I've talked about, you know, whether they're operating on a single level or multi-level are open source, and they have very vibrant communities around them. So it's a great way to chat and interact with them and, and uh, you know, get to know what are the, what works and what doesn't work. But from our perspective, yeah, we are definitely open sourcing as much of our code and trying to integrate that and show examples of what could be possible with uh, MLIR, it just not just matrix multiplication, you know, entire graphs, or you know, running that on thousands of clusters. Are there different kinds of problems that need to be solved there? And you know, at least if we can create a place where we can create, uh, a, you know, even if we have a common place where people can gather and talk about it, I think that would be very valuable. And just to clarify, when you're talking about auto tuning here, you're you're doing this at compile time without actually running the code. That's so right. what you're exploring is a is a model of the architecture, uh, as opposed to in, instead of generating code and then running it on the, That's, on the, on that, the device well, yeah. and then seeing how fast it runs. Absolutely. So we actually we can work both ways, but yes, uh, you know, there's depending on your constraints and how much time you have and what you know, what you're interested in, uh, we can enable anything. Right. Which, yeah. which you know, I guess that's really the question. How long does it take to do this auto-tuning, this design space exploration? Uh, that, in your tool? Right, that's a great question, right? And so uh, it really, as I said, it comes down to uh, the constraints that you have, right? So uh, let me give you an example of kind of uh, what people have done in the past. So, you know, you some people have the, the, the idea that you know, I, I know what a convolution looks like. I, I have a general sense of what the IR looks like, but I want my optimizer to kind of have the freedom and flexibility to design new kinds of IR and modify the IR. So that's actually a very unconstrained search space. Sure, you know, uh, maybe there's the promise of finding, you know, something that, uh, I don't know, is way out there, but most of the time you'll be ending up in illegal, inv invalid solutions, right? And so in that case, if we were to take that approach, you know, I would say it would take a very long time. To accomplish that, so what we try to do is be more pragmatic, pragmatic about that, and really what we try to do is um, define sort of experts, like things that we know are good, and once we have that, that automatically constrains this space. Now, instead of searching for this skeleton IR that is going to be the magical IR, you have a bunch of a hand, a fixed number, finite number of experts, and each expert has a fixed constrained search space. And so when you do that, you end up with something that can be reasonably quick on the order of hours instead of months. Right. That's great. I mean, even minutes or seconds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Better, yeah, right? so. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess a lot of times that's a trade-off that everybody has to make when they're building a system, right? That's some, right. In some cases, you know, you might need seconds or, or even faster than that. In other cases, maybe, you know, running overnight is, is good enough. That's right. So. And, and it comes down to really, like, what are you going after, right? Is it, do you want to have your ML perf submission or is this, you know, just... <laughs> Something else, yeah. Cool. Well, I think uh, that's a good place to end, and uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. So thanks a lot, Harsh. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. So our next speaker is uh, Siraj Sudhir. He uh, has been working in the field of machine learning compilation and system design uh, at ARM. And as part of the ARM ML technology team, he created the TOSA dialect in MLIR and has really been driving the development of uh, TOSA as a as a funnel uh, 
uh, from a lot of different front-end frameworks, uh, including TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, and PyTorch. Uh, so uh, I will hand it over to Suraj, who is going to, to talk about his work in TOSA and uh, some of the machine learning flows that have been going on. Hello, and welcome to this talk on machine learning frameworks and front-end enabler R. My name is Sorak Sadeo, and I'll talk about the subject and describe my own experience with having built a front-end infrastructure and MLR during my time as a senior principal software engineer in the machine learning technology group at ARM. At the end of this talk, you will hopefully have useful insights into how MLR enables us to craft end-to-end -end compilation solutions connecting frameworks to code generation as well as ideas on how to approach and estimate the cost of developing such connectivity. So let's start with the question. What are machine learning frameworks and what do these compiler frontends do? Subsequently, how does MLR enable us to solve the compiler frontend problem? Machine learning frameworks are essentially interfaces that researchers and machine learning model developers use to craft, test, tune, and deploy machine learning are neural network models. The models themselves are computer programs expressing algorithms that pass input streams to identify patterns or make predictions. The framework could be training the model using uh, specialized data that is used to train it, or the model could be deployed to pass live real-world data, which is called inference. The input data may be of particular data types and there may be more considerations involved. There are also a number of frameworks out there and I could easily fill up the entire slide with logos of them. And the ones on here are essentially the ones I have used. They are not any indicator of any specific endorsements or preference on my part. Having got the disclaimer out of the way, this also implies the reality that there is not one single framework that everyone uses. These frameworks come with a range of capabilities. At their most basic level, they could be just a high-level language of choice. The machine learning model researcher could craft individual neural networks, operation kernels explicitly as functions in the high-level language, and implement connectivity by organizing the kernel invocations such that they together constitute the machine learning model. But of course, frameworks do a lot more than that. They provide a rich set of defined constructs or APIs of these operations, which may number the hundreds to over a thousand, as in the case of TensorFlow. They support a range of data types, offer support for development around familiar high-level languages, and more. Further, the story around frameworks has continued to evolve in different directions, some tailored to specific use cases and others being broader. Some with richer developer-friendly capabilities popular in the research community, while others that are more mature deployment capabilities targeting inference. Some are even designed for specific use cases, ranging from the data center to mobile to embedded platforms. For example, from personal experience, it has been a significantly different problem supporting PyTorch compared to TensorFlow Lite. There are far more operations in TensorFlow than in TensorFlow Lite. However, there has also been a process of the developer at Kio system maturing. Over time, they have tended to pick up some of the best ideas from each other. For a compiler developer, that's a good thing since it narrows down the scope across frameworks or at least increases commonality and reusability. From an ML compiler or system designer's perspective, the current reality is that even supporting a single rich framework like PyTorch for machine learning compilation is a significant undertaking. Then we have the current reality of multiple popular frameworks, at least some of which must typically be supported. There may be convergence or alignment towards a single framework over time, but this can't be predicted. As this evolution and maturation happens, the ML model compilation and execution infrastructure must support that too. It's often clear what frameworks are need to be supported, with at least some level of clarity as to what capabilities of the frameworks must be supported as an early plan of record. The underlying hardware targets and therefore their low-level optimized code generation are also tractable or familiar topics, 
But how do you connect the two together? What enables such connectivity to be accomplished effectively? Furthermore, are there compiler infrastructures with the ability to accommodate a change in the plan of record? For example, to support another framework or enable another backend target without effectively reconstructing an entirely separate solution towards each of these. Now let's look at framework frontends from a perspective of what the compiler should consume, targeting some arbitrary hardware capability. Explosiveness generally means that the framework should not constrain or handicap the creative expression of the machine learning model researcher or the developer. They will usually want to use a language that they are familiar with, such as C++, Python, or some other. There is the question of how the model is constructed. This matters very much to compilation. The language may be used as an accessory to construct the model, essentially an active declarative metaprogramming of the model. This doesn't fully utilize the capabilities of the language, but instead constructs a terse and well-defined language-neutral form of the model defined by the framework itself that is amenable to serialization and deployment. In this manner, the framework enables the compilation flow, but potentially at the cost of the ability of the developers to express themselves. TensorFlow 1.0 used this, and it was great for large static models and in large-scale deployed contexts. Recently, more imperative approaches have gained broad popularity. Rather than the program being used to construct a model, the program itself was the model, with the model embedded within. This means that the developer can utilize the entire rich scope of the high-level language to express their model. On the other hand, to select the essential constructs of the machine learning model from the overall program can be a difficult compilation task. As a simple example, you'll want to throw away things like debug messages and other things that are on functional parts of the model. Between these paradigms, there are alternatives. Frameworks can define that machine learning models can to be expressed using a collection of API extensions for the underlying language, utilizing only a subset of the language data types, the control flow constructs, and other capabilities, or place other restrictions in a quest to balance explosiveness against ensuring the boundedness of the compilation problem to make compilation easier. For the ML compiler, the first step in taking the workload from the framework level is thus the construction of an abstract intermediate representational form of the graph of the functional part of the model. There was a broadly common set of operators available across most popular frameworks. For example, they can all be expected to have convolution or pooling to be present. Beyond these, they may have additional capabilities that impact their compilation. The number of operators, for example, could range from just over 100 to well over 1,000. So that's a pretty wide range. Some frameworks may adapt new operators sooner than others and offer the ability to define user-defined custom operators. They may offer integration with popular libraries like NumPy or more domain-specific ones. Infrastructural capabilities become load-bearing as the model form stabilizes. Different kinds of quantization approaches may need to be accommodated by the compiler, some that happen during the course of training and some after that. Model optimizations cover both target-independent and target-dependent ones. The former encompasses things like graph pruning, and the latter, for example, addresses target-specific weight compression, these considerations become prominent when the focus shifts from establishing basic functionality and the accuracy of the model to ensuring that it is performant when deployed. The number of framework-driven requirements can amount to a substantial software engineering problem. From personal experience, production-level support for consuming a single framework can amount to several person months to a few person years of engineering work, depending upon the plan of record. A capable compiler infrastructure that enables rapid, effective modular development is critical to ensuring that all this works well. That brings us to the topic of MLIR.
as previously presented earlier during this tutorial. MLA uh, enables progressive transformation of a program with a rich set of capabilities for a compiler developer to utilize. The first step here is therefore converting the model from its framework defined serialization form to MLR. The serialized form is typically a persistent and documented storable form separate from the in memory representation of the framework development environment. Typically, this is something like the TensorFlow protobuf or the TouchScript format in PyTorch. It may not be the final version of the model in terms of its functional construct or the optimizations or its fully trained form, but that's fine. The reason a stable and documented serialized form of the model matters is that it enables the implementation of translators that convert from the serialized form to MLR. This part is typically a parsing exercise, and the documented form enables the parser to be constructed. This is then mapped to the MLR form by identifying operators in the parsed form to those that are defined in the MLR dialect of the framework. So the consequence is that to implement this flow, two things are required. A documented form that enables the construction of the actual parser to translate from the serialized form and the MLR dialect that enables the matchup to construct the MLR form. This enables the rest of the compiler flow to be MLR based. Thankfully, the MLR dialect implementations are already present for several front ends that are very popular, and so are the translators from their serialized representations. TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, PyTorch, Onyx, and JAX all have them already. They don't necessarily cover all the operators in these frameworks, but being open sourced, what's required can be collaboratively added. Sometimes somebody comes up with a new model with an operator that is not present in the MLR based translator of the framework, in which case it can be added through the community process. And this is not an infrequent occurrence. The broad community interest in maintaining high fidelity translators for frameworks therefore benefits everyone, every MLI user in this case. Therefore, projects that integrate a particular framework as input can thus leverage the existing MLI translator infrastructure available publicly. However, the end result is an MLI view of the framework level content. It isn't necessarily the most suitable form to pass to code generation. Connecting the two together, even with MLI, is a complex problem that requires the developer to have a clear idea of what the goals of the compiler are. These goals strongly impact the connective dialect between these parts. The flexibility of MLIR enables some of the design scope to be expanded or modified, but fundamentally, to connect the framework to the code generation requires the specification of a well-defined interfacing construct based upon user needs. A lot of my own experience in MLIR is within this domain, so I'll speak from experience in depth as well. But before getting to that, a quick slide to offer a shout out to the MLR implementations of the framework that I'm familiar with and have used. Each of these are substantial efforts that cost several person years of work with vibrant community contributions. The TensorFlow and the TensorFlow Lite translators and the MLR dialects are part of the TensorFlow repository. The Touch MLR project is a new LLVM incubator project and a great new path to consume PyTorch content and build an MLR based compiler stack for that framework, and I have been actively part of that community. JAX is a new framework from Google with a very active MLR compiler development around it. Then there's the Onyx MLR project, which is a great team who have developed the Onyx specification with an MLR. Getting back to the topic of connecting framework to code generation, access to framework MLR dialects and translators only offers the compiler designer an option as to what frameworks the compiler can consume. Looking at the figure here, the lines pointing down are the frameworks converted to MLR are being consumed. The column on the left is a collection of capability requirements that are typically demanded of the compiler while consuming the frameworks. From there on, 
This becomes a general software engineering problem, which front-end does the compiler intend to support what backends are the compiler targeting, as it intended for inference or training, what kind of data types, and consequently perhaps how to address the question of quantized model content. Other capabilities could include supporting custom operators, custom data types, for example, novel floating point types, even versioning of operators because frameworks evolve. With an MLIR, these design problems can be tackled in a modular and organized manner, but as this figure indicates, it requires a clear picture of the actual goals and non-goals, as well as a carefully considered view of what level of abstraction to tackle each of these requirements at. Connecting one or more framework to the backend code generation can be a deceptively difficult problem. Framework operators are geared towards feature richness and not terseness or compactness for the purpose of code generation. Due to the relatively larger number of more complex front-end operators that may continuously evolve high-level graph transformations, for example, fake quantization, are much more complicated to implement. If the compiler desires to handle different frameworks, even though they have a large number of broadly similar operators, each of them may have different variances, variants of its operators. For example, the resize or uh, the upsampling operator may have specialized interpolation modes that are present only in some frameworks, but, on, but not others. The average pooling operator may specify rounding modes that are only present in some frameworks. If the compiler and was to tackle code generation from the framework directly, this leads to a large amount of complexity, uh, duplication, and in general, a significant software engineering cost that can be mitigated. To do so, an ideal approach to compilation is to decouple the framework level abstraction from the code generation level. This is done by reducing the front-end operations to a set of more compilation-friendly primitive operators. A so-called reduction of a wasteland dialect as my collaborator Stella Lorenzo, the lead of the Google Yuri MLI compiler team, puts it. Several high-level operators can be decomposed into a collection of primitives. For example, quantized domain scaling can be exposed using element-wise addition and multiplication operations. By decomposing multiple front-end operators into such dialects, Compiler development can focus on specific attributes of low-level operator constructs. For example, the dialect could expose a set of simplified tensor-level operators. It could implement linear algebra primitives. There could be dialects that express basic arithmetic operations or others that express various abstract forms of mm, control flow. MLIR fundamentally enables the developer to make decisions as to how to decompose a more complex high-level construct far removed from the underlying hardware progressively into forms more closely aligned to the actual target hardware. Within the MLIR ecosystem, there already exists multiple dialects that enable the compiler developer to progressively lower the high-level operator constructs into targeted constructs suited to code generation. Let's look over a few of those. The Tessa dialect is part of the MLR upstream repository and therefore accessible to any user of MLR over its creator and have continued to have an active role in its development. It is specification based, meaning that it is fundamentally a mid level compiler dialect implementation of a formal specification that defines a list of simpler reduced operators, the data types to support, the exact functionality and position. It is designed this way to enable hardware software code design. A hardware developer can simultaneously design from the specification with the software side aligned to it. The high level operations are the HLO dialect as the input language of the accelerated linear algebra or the XLA compiler at Google. It has a much longer history than Tessa and is an established part of the Google machine learning compiler solutions. It is the primary output of the Google's new exciting JAX framework for the purpose of compilation. There are a lot of interesting new happenings in HLO that are the topic of active community conversations today. The Lineage or the Linear Algebra dialect is an extremely powerful code generation oriented dialect 
that is also part of the MLI upstream like Tesla. As we will show by example later on, it sits at a slightly lower level of abstraction than Tesla or HLO, closer to actual code generation mechanisms such as styling, vectorizations or other capabilities that my tutorial collaborator Harsh Menon spoke about in his excellent talk. There exists transformation between all of these dialects. There's one between Tesla to Lenage, and one from HLO to Lenage, and one in development from HLO to Tesla. They serve particular compilation pathway needs. For example, the HLO to Tesla path enables JAX to be consumed by a compiler depending primarily on Tesla. Each of these is the result of a significant amount of carefully considered effort to define their basis, their constituent operators, and they even fundamentally have a rational document that explains why their construction is in the manner it is. To guide listeners into this thought process, I will dig into the one I worked on. The Tesla dialect was designed to serve the purpose of lowering operators from multiple frameworks and simultaneously defining a stable, versioned operator set architecture for hardware development. From a systems level perspective, one can view Tesla as analogous to a CPU or GPU ISC, but at a higher tensor level of abstraction, as an operator set architecture for a broad class of ML accelerator platforms. The underlying hardware in turn implements the abstract architectural model described by Tesla as an optimized macroarchitectural design. This hardware could be fully custom, a semi-custom heterogeneous form, or an emulated abstract architecture implemented by a general purpose CPU. A trivial mental map here would be one of a reference architecture implemented in a hypervisor layer that runs on potentially multiple underlying hardware implementations. The code generation in this case becomes one of progressively lowering from Tesla to the corresponding low-level macroarchitectural programming steps. For example, for custom hardware, this results in the generation of flowable microcode that drives the ML accelerator. The Tesla MLI dialect is an implementation of the specification. Framework level content is lower to Tesla, and then it, the Tesla form targets various backends that are designed to be Tesla compatible. A backend that implements a Tesla version standard can run any Tesla model of that version. Different accelerator designs can all target the Tesla major version, ignoring the framework content in it. It is decoupled from to the extent that the model can be fully expressed in Tesla. As part of the specification, Tesla defines the functionality and position of the operators. This means, for example, that multiple implementations of Tesla supporting its quantized 8-bit mode will all generate the same result in a bit accurate manner when running the same Tesla model. The development of Tesla itself involved discussions on aligning operator precision and minute detail with the framework site stakeholders. Along with the openly available dialect, the specification of the reference model, effectively a functional golden reference runtime, are also publicly available for Tesla. The spec is also open to feedback and already contains operators proposed from entities besides ZOM. Profiles in Tesla encapsulate a collection of capabilities that a hardware implementation can target. The base inference profile supports only quantized 8 and 16 bit integer data types. The main inference profile supports floating point as well. The training profile supports ML model training. For example, if you wanted to implement a small Tesla compliant embedded accelerator consuming quantized 8 bit inference, you would therefore implement the base inference profile which is just a subset of the operators and their functionality that you need to accomplish thus. The effort on framework conversions also de demonstrate an example of progressively greater community collaboration that is possible in the ML MLI ecosystem. The TensorFlow variant legalizations were originally developed almost entirely at ARM, though they have since received substantial input from Google and others. They were offered along with the dialect itself as a pathway into it. This was important as the dialect would otherwise be an island with no conversion pathway into or out of it. <laughs>
the torch MLA conversions were implemented because of active community interest in this pathway beyond um, zone interest, and it has therefore received input and support from the vibrant touch MLA community. The Onyx pathway implementation is in fact driven by the community, with AMD being the primary one. Now let's look at some examples of how the conversions from a framework to a mid-level IR like Tosa looks like. This example presents a fairly compli complicated operator. From the TensorFlow Lite framework, we have a quantized convolution up with the various addition being performed after convolution and a fused ReLU6 activation function right afterwards. You don't need to have, get into all the line-by-line -line detail. I've just pitted the entire test for completeness, but really the only thing of interest is the CON2D command. The data type was symmetrically quantized signed 16-bit content, meaning the zero points are zeros, but there's a scale factor, which is a long floating point number you see next to the words I16 colon F32, which indicates quantization from 32-bit floating point to signed 16-bit integer domain. The input and output scales are also different, which means there will be a scaling operation performed at the end. Tesla legalizes. Legalization decomposes those as follows. The Tessa continuity does not embed the output rescaling or the activation function fusion. However, this fusion can be accomplished during code generation if required. The rescale operator is an operation in Tessa that enables scaling to another domain. The links in the operators point to their description in the specification, which is handy. For example, code generation can refer to the Tessa specification for the precise functional algorithm for the operation in question and can validate the code, generated, code generated output against TESA reference model output. The same reference model can be used as a golden reference for RTL verification. And this is literally how the TESA hardware code design at ARM happens. Matrix multiplication is a very common ML computational primitive. High level frameworks may define very complex versions of this operator that do not easily translate to a custom or fixed function hardware implementation. Even for CPU code generation, it may help to optimize MATMO for a few canonical forms to aid tiling and auto vectorization, for example. For example, in PyTorch, the MATMO command takes multi dimensional inputs without any constraint. Broadcasting along dimensions may be implicit or explicit and may occur between the left-hand side and the right-hand side in either direction. The test of MATML operation takes only two three-dimensional inputs and emits a three-dimensional output. So how do you fit this? This is a very good example of how the high-level framework may have a much more complex version of something that is defined in the mid-level IR. The Tesla legalization of MATML and the Touch MLA project performs a series of optional dimension transposes and reshapes prior to and after the MATML. The shapes of the left hand side and the right hand side mandate what exactly happens here. All the dimensions that are common to both the left hand side and the right hand sides are squashed together to constitute the leftmost parameter of both the left hand side and the right hand side of the Tesla MATML input. Then, all the non accumulating Broadcasting dimensions perform their broadcasting and get squashed at the next parameter for the left hand side and right hand side input. The low level code generation ensures that broadcasting is performed along these dimensions. Finally, we have the actual accumulating dimension. Together, you have three dimensional input and three dimensional output for the Tesla MATMO. After the MATMO, the opposite happens. The squashed dimensions are reshaped to unsquash them and transposed as necessary to generate the correct output shape. As you can see, you have two inputs over here, a 4x4x16x32 four by four by by input, and as a left-hand side, and an 8x32x17 input at the right-hand side, which generates the correct output shape, 4x8x16x17 at the final output shape after the last transpose. The final example is that of multidimensional gather from TensorFlow. Scatter and gather operations are popular but complex data layer tops that are often problematic to define a canonical form for an a mid-level IR. While developing Tesla, we spent a lot of time on it as well. 
but the end result is a farm that works with multiple variants of the gather operator across multiple frameworks. As in the case of Matmul, the process of exposing multidimensional gather in TensorFlow using a single test gather form involves a series of reshapes, reduction sums along axes, and then a final reshape at the end. All of these examples are from Tesla legalization unit test infrastructure, which emits thousands of test cases exercising permutations for each of the legalizations, approximately 20,000 tests in the case of the TensorFlow test path. For every test, the Tesla reference model validates the functional precision and bit accuracy versus the original framework reference output. So far, I've spoken about generating mid-level RR, the Tesla farm. But what about connecting it to code generation? The slide is about that. First off, everything in the slide is the credit Charles team colleagues in the Google Yuri MLR team. This is their work, and a great example of the sort of community collaboration that we have had the pleasure of experiencing in the MLR ecosystem. It implements conversions from Tesla to several lower-level dialects closer to code generation. The knowledge, the knowledge named the arithmetic and the structured control flow and tensor dialects. With this process, one can start from one of the support frameworks, generate the TESA form, and subsequently legalize to a combination of these co-generation dialects and go all the way down to, for example, to LVMRR, and therefore generate binary output for CPUs and GPUs in this manner. This end-to-end -end path is already utilized within the Touch MLR project, where the TESA backend path involves these to generate functional output when one runs the full end-to-end -end unit test suit. These transformations are something that can be invoked from the MLR upstream today on TESA models using the command line beta demo, for example. They can also be invoked as part of the past pipeline of your own compiler, since these are all part of the MLR upstream, they are accessible to any MLR based compiler. The previous examples demonstrate the amount of effort that goes into building connect connective infrastructure around a dialect. Even for a mid-level dialect like Tesla, this means all the connectivity from multiple frameworks and the connectivity out of the dialect to multiple other frameworks at a lower level of abstraction close to the middle. In addition, other examples demonstrate it is very valuable to have a functional testing infrastructure at this level because it ensures the fidelity of the legalizations both into and out of the dialect. Imagine you have a compiler with n dialects of abstraction and their functional failures. How do you begin to root cause where they happen? It helps to have checkpoints like these where the functional validity can be asserted. The front end parts to a dialect like Tesla are used to exercise thousands of real world models today. These include many of the more popular networks you might have heard of, like, like Inception, Rosnet, or BERT. In addition, as described previously, the specification has enabled ongoing efforts to implement conformant microarchitectural designs for machine learning accelerators at ARM and elsewhere. In the approximately year and a half since Tesla was open sourced, there has been a significant amount of collaborative development, which have all tallied up probably once to several person years. It is a measure of the rapid collaborative development that the MLI community has enabled. This is one of the greatest attributes of MLI and the community in my own experience. Rather than being on the hook for your entire software stack, it offers the ability to implement modular designs, both offering to and receiving collaboration from the MLI ecosystem. It doesn't really matter if you're a small or a large entity when you have something interesting. They are very forg forgiving of and helpful to newbies. And at one time, we were one too. And our experience was very positive. The MLI ecosystem has many advanced compiler experts, but fundamentally, the community is not an ivory tower. And from my personal experience, they are very accessible and helpful. While the, while the reflections from Tesla most of what is described in the slide is how were generally applicable and hopefully help for meta knowledge. During the course of developing Tesla with an MLI from scratch, we learned a lot about the subdomain of the ML compilation problem.
at the beginning of a software engineering endeavor towards an ML compiler, the problem statement is one of defining what the compiler needs to support. As described initially, that means what frameworks, what backends, and what technical requirements of the compiler. You can start by leveraging existing framework dialect infrastructure. Then the question is, what does your connective mid-level IR look like? Should it be something closer to the fronted, a more compilation-focused construct like HLO? Uh, should it be opt optimized for a particular frontend? Or do you want a just slightly more bottom-up abstraction that is co-design friendly? Like Tessa does, do you intend to iterate and grow rapidly without necessarily any notion of backward compatibility or stability or even having a specification matter? Something we've found useful has been to literally define principles or rational around the dialect. The links here point to principles for the operator's inclusion in Tessa and the original document for Lineage. These are formally stated documents that define why these dialects were constructed in a certain way. This is, from experience, very useful to have, and it helps avoid operator and dialect definition shown. Over the long term, it helps retain dialect cushion and avoid accumulation of technical debt. MLIR makes it really easy to construct dialect to define operators, so much so that it could be misused due to an over-eagerness to rapidly construct solutions as one tries to understand or define their problem statement. Of course, leveraging MLIR's capabilities for rap to rapidly experiment is fine, but there's a balance to quickly experimenting with operator constructs, which MLIR enables you to do easily and ensuring that this is done in a fundamentally structured and organized manner. As mentioned previously, each of the mid-level dialects mentioned here are the result of multiple person years of effort with contributions across multiple companies. The ease that MLR affords to very quickly construct an arbitrary dialect with a bunch of operators contrasts against the difficulty of needing to define good designs. The latter is still a significant and standard software engineering problem that doesn't become easier because of MLR. If you're able to leverage your existing dialects like HLO or TSA, depending upon your specific needs, that's great. If a custom model level dialect is required to perform this connectivity, then it's important to think and estimate the cost of everything, the time to define the problem, and then a core basis for the dialect constructs and then the cost of implementing all of the pathways into and out of the dialect. All of these are non-trivial and substantial project management costs. It's very much possible to do this in a collaborative manner, however, and this has been a personal experience with Chasa. If you have a great conceptual idea, you can post a request for comment or an RFC on the MLR discourse board or present during the weekly MLIR open design meeting or both. In the best case, there would be substantial community interest in collaborating, thereby accelerating development, helping everybody. So, to leave for the sports analogy, middle of a are like quarterbacks that receive the ball from the front end of the line and have to figure out how to pass to the code generation pathways effectively. You can take this analogy in many directions and visualize the problem in terms of what the entity should look like, where it needs to stand, and how to figure out its game plan, and so on. Therefore, an ML front-end compiler developer may potentially have to support multiple frameworks. The good news is that there are multiple credible production-level framework consumption paths in MLR. This forum was hardware and systems engineering focused, and while the corresponding low-level code generation stack may be more familiar or tractable picture, it needs to be connected using one or more mid-level dialects from the front end because there's a very large gap in abstraction between the two. As the stack covered, there were several such dialects available within MLIR upstream repository as well as popular framework repositories like TensorFlow that a machine learning compiler developer can leverage for their purposes. If you're compelled to define your own, then the well-documented approaches that were used to define these existing dialects can hopefully serve as a valuable basis and offer guiding suggestions on how to define your own. Developers can also leverage the involvement of the community in interesting 
projects and the community is very much a force multiplier here. As I conclude this talk, I'd like to thank the uh, machine learning technology and engineering teams without whose support and investment into all of this work, I would not be in a position to stand here talking to you about the subject in the first place. When we took Tesla public, the Google, your email uh, team, and were nothing but incredibly supportive, even when we originally showed up with the 15,000 line pull request of all the code. This collaboration has continued to expand and now encompasses much beyond just one dialect. The broad ML community, particularly the Tosh ML and the Onyx ML and several others, have been extremely positive and supportive, enabling a rate of development that, despite the necessary procedures, has been strong enough to enable corporate decision making on product level development using ML. And that concludes this talk. Thank you all for watching. Great. Thanks a lot, Sudhir. So we have a few questions. Um, the first is about uh, sort of unusual data types. Uh, so TOSA is a kind of a standards-driven uh, approach to how you're going to define these, uh, these operations. Um, so how does TOSA deal with more unusual data types like um, arbitrary bit width integers or maybe ternary data types that would be used in a machine learning application or uh, non IEEE compliant floating point numbers. Are these things that are within the scope of TOSA or are these things that we would have to add or do you see there being like a, an extension mechanism for TOSA where people could have non-standard uh, operations inside a TOSA design? Okay, thank you both for the question. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, something we have dealt with very recently. So one of the things I want to test something like test is that we define the precise functionality of the operators and of course the actual bit accurate position involved in computing the result from the operator. So when you come up with a non-standard data type or something like a bring your own floating point type that also involves a number of particular details as to their behavior that needs to be resolved. And now when you think about data types, there are, there are essentially two kinds of data types, one being the input data type and one being, for example, for convolution, the accumulation data type. So if you think about some kind of an on-standard data type, like an 8-bit floating point or uh, uh, MSFP12 or something like that, how do you define the process of accumulation with those input data types? So when it comes to something like TESA, what the clear specification of a, the functionality of the operations, it needs to not just be able to say, yes, I support this data type, but also provide a complete answer to the question of how the process of calculation, accumulation, and storage associated with processing those data types done. That's quite easy to do when it comes to standard IEEE 754 tabs when we can just take FP32 or FP16 as an input, accumulate to FP32, and still the result. But what happens when we're dealing with something like FP8 or MSFP12 or something like that? We also need to define what is the manner in which the use of these data types is valid in the use case context. It's possible that some other designer might use the same data type in a very different manner. And how do you resolve what constitutes the accurate manner in which you define how these data types can be utilized? We've tried to balance this question by trying to, for example, define a way for the rescale operator, for example, to just convert from FP8 or some other non-standard type to the nearest IEEE 754 type. For example, scale up from FP8 or MSFP12 to FP16, and then work from there. But whether or not that is the right way to do this is really a question for the implementer, the hardware implementer, to answer. So that's something we've been trying to get feedback on. Yeah, I guess it, 
from a standards compliant perspective, it seems like you want to be able to constrain what an implementation is able to do. But you mentioned particularly the case of accumulation is a challenging one since uh, a lot of times when you're building a device or an, an accelerator, then uh, trying around different ways of performing the accumulation is often one of the things that you want to explore. Yep, exactly. and, and it's very difficult to build uh, exactly bit accurate uh, even even for for 32-bit floating point, you'll get small bit errors depending on the order of accumulation. And in in yep. a lot of high-performance yep. computing exactly. applications, people have been looking at like repeatable floating point as a as something that may be valuable that you you don't necessarily yep. get unless you design very carefully for uh, for uh, to, to to make that happen. And a lot of times in machine learning accelerators, that's one of the first things that you'd want to, to jettison, right? You, as an implementer, you want to provide something that is good enough in a machine learning sense, but but doesn't have uh, have to actually have bit accuracy. So, wh wh what's your view on you know from a Tosa perspective? Is this something where we need to Tosa needs to grow, or is this something where uh, it's it's just up to an implementer who is building a system around TOSA how much of the compliance aspect they enforce. Okay, that's a very good question. And it's much easier to answer this in the context of quantitative integer types where we can exactly define the bit position, bit accuracy. Floating point types, we've been looking at this from different perspectives. We've thought about, for example, offering a a sliding range of scores as to the accuracy of the calculation, so as to say that this particular TASA compliant device achieved a certain percentage score in terms of how accurate it is. And on the other hand, you could have some kind of a graded, more discrete set of numbers, so it's up to a certain percentage or up to a certain standard deviation of accuracy, but this involves a lot of for all experiments with floating point types to figure out what constitutes thresholds that could be effective points where you could say that the TESA compliance is a particular level for that particular data type. And trying to achieve this is something we have been trying to fit into TESA right now. And this also overlaps with the conversation on non-standard data types, which is also part of this whole story. It applies to standard and non-standard data types just the same. Yeah, I guess at a certain level, one of the things that you'd want to avoid is is people gaming the system too much. Uh, you know, it often happens with benchmarks, and so you, you know, exactly you, the, the, the <laughs> trick is how do you keep people honest? I guess at a certain level. So uh, I think that that's definitely a, a, a challenge. So uh, an, another question is uh, sort of related to Tosa and and some of the other uh, frameworks out there that sort of exist at a at a at the same level. Uh, you know. We have the, the front-end frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow and JAX. Um, but then, you, you know, uh, TOSA is sort of fits one level down where you would come from those high-level frameworks into TOSA. Um, and uh, Stable HLO, for instance, uh, that came out of the, the TensorFlow work uh, is, is another dialect that has been proposed that sort of fits at the same level of abstraction. I was wondering if maybe you could compare and contrast uh, your approach in TOSA with what you've seen of, of stable HLO. Uh, are these things that are competing or are they complementary and they work together? What do you what do you see? That's a very good question. Actually, um, I cannot speak for a lot of details of stable HLO because for one, I don't work at Google and it's a very new thing that's still in the proposal stage. So I have been involved in a lot of conversations with them about this. Uh, I see it as fundamentally complementary and something uh, much more purely a uh, compiler dialect as opposed to Chelsea that tries to balance two things, one being defining a specification for hardware design, and secondly, the other side of the mirror being the uh, compiler dialect implementation itself that serves certain purposes. And there's a hard data for us to handle with the hardware design support, stability, as well as being a compiler dialect that is as flexible and capable as possible for compilation purposes. Whereas stable HLO is sort of right from having the hardware dependence as far as I understand it, and therefore has more stronger, more accessible compiler capabilities. And therefore, in my view, it sits slightly higher in abstraction 
just as the Lenoge dialect is slightly lower than Chelsea. And actually, our co presenter Jack and I have been working, talking about the subject, and there's likely to be a lowering pass from HLO to Chelsea. I've spoken about that. It's under implementation as far as I understand. So the lowering is likely to be something like stable HLO being an effective compiler front end just below the frameworks with hardware implementation friendly to like, like Chelsea right below it in case you're trying to code generate for accelerators or any other project for which you desire to use Chelsea, for example. Great. Well, thanks a lot for your talk, Suraj. Uh, definitely machine learning is one of the very big application areas for uh, MLIR. And there's lots of people building uh, machine learning accelerators out there. So uh, hopefully we can get uh, uh, even more of them using MLIR. So thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so th this is actually a double feature. We have uh, two speakers. Uh, one, the first is uh, Andrew Lenharth. So Andrew has been leading the hard li hardware language and compiler development efforts at Sci5. Uh, he's been working with uh, compilers for a long time, uh, and particularly programming models and, and runtimes for, for parallel programming. And Sci5 is very interested in, in how you build uh, new hardware um, and, and has been applying MLAR to, to, uh, to, to doing that. Uh, the, the other speaker is John Demi. Uh, John is a FPGA tools and compiler engineer at Microsoft. Uh, so more on the FPGA side, whereas Sci5 is a little bit more oriented towards the ASIC side. Uh, John started there as an intern in 2013 working on the Catapult group uh, using FPGAs to implement data center applications and has been working passionately on better tooling and compilers for FPGAs ever since then. Uh, so the, this talk is going to be a little unusual. It's going to jump straight into a demonstration of uh, some of the MLAR capabilities uh, applied to an end-to-end -end application. So this, end this application is going to start in PyTorch and go all the way down to, to generating code in an FPGA. Um, and then John and Andrew are going to explain uh, how that how that demo works. So I think we can go to the demo. Great. This is a PyTorch model that we're going to compile with our HLS flow. It starts with a torch matrix multiply that's going to be one dimensional dot product. We compile it using torch MLIR, which outputs the MLIR Linalge dialect. We then compile that down to the MLIR affine dialect and run some affine transformations to optimize the loops, which we can then lower to the MLIR control flow dialect. From there, we can lower to circuits handshake dialect, which represents the program as a handshaking data flow graph, and can then lower that into hardware using circuit. From there, we run an ESI program to wrap that with co-simulation interfaces, compile the simulator with Verilator, and start the Verilator simulation. Then we connect to that via ESI's co-simulator interface, and we can send inputs into the co-simulation from Python and confirm the co-simulation result with the PyTorch result. Um, so you can run whatever inputs you want and compare the co-simulation result you can run with random inputs and confirm that you still get equivalent results between co-simulation and PyTorch. OK, so we saw an end-to-end -end demo where we took a PyTorch kernel, went to simulation if a hardware module for that. And to do that, we used the circuit technology stack, which I want to talk about more. So what is circuit? Circuit is an MLIR-based compiler stack for doing hardware tooling. Um, that could be synthesis, that could be front-end languages, it could be simulation. It's really trying to give you a unified single representation um, or a single library that you can use. It's an LVM incubator project, so it's part of the LLVM uh, project, and it's built on MLIR. So what's it really trying to do? Well. If you think about the undergraduate view of, of building hardware, right? You have some guy, he types in Emacs, 
certainly not Vim, some Verilog. He runs it in simulation, it passes, feeds it to an FPGA or tapes it out, right? Like this naive view, as we all know, is not how hardware actually works. Hardware is a large, hardware design is a large process with a lot of different domains that interact. So there's a lot of different specialties and a lot of special tools, and they all are modeling different aspects of the system. And they all, since they're modeling different things, tend to have different representations of the system. So there's a lot of problems here, which is we have a bunch of tools. They have not just a bunch of tools, but we have a bunch of languages or sub-languages. They're connected through this, let's call it sketchy language of, of uh, Verilog. And that means that there's a lot of redundancy in representation. There's a lot of redundancy in specifications. So it's really hard to kind of reuse things. There's multiple sources of truth. Um, it's very painful. And more importantly, because of this split, like all of these separate domains are just loosely coupled. Um, so designs become really messy. There's a lot of scripts. There's a lot of glue. There's a lot of build kludges. Like it's, it's very messy. Um, and yes, there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of tools to work on this problem, but they don't tend to talk to each other through anything but um, Verilog. And even where there are standards for some, for some parts of the domain, vendors tend to have different extensions and they tend to support different parts of Verilog. So um, there's a mess there. And in the open source world, there's a lot of small projects that don't have huge developer communities and they're all repeating work. They all have to make a Verilog parser and an emitter and a bunch of internal representation. So there's a lot of redundant work in the ecosystem. And there's a lot of unnecessary stuff you have to do to build a tool that isn't interesting to your domain, right? You don't really care about Verilog parsing if you want to do a formal equivalence tool. Like that's not the interesting part of your tool. So how is this solved in the software world, in the languages world? Because this was a big problem in, in the 90s, right? All the tools were very different and they all had their own little stack. So what happened is we started coalescing around library-based uh, tooling. So we built out foundational libraries that provided all of the things you didn't want to implement so that if you were doing a new language, you just had to worry about your language bits and you got a code generator for free and you got code generators for a lot of platforms for free and you almost got JIT execution for free. Um, so you can focus on the thing you want to build and not on the things that you don't want to build. So can we do that for hardware? And this is what Circuit's trying to do, to provide that kind of foundational technology to build interesting things faster. Now, like I said, Circuit is based on MLIR um, and it's pushing MLIR in interesting ways. You can go to last year's LVM Developers Conference. I have a link here for that, where Chris Lattner and I gave a keynote on some of the interesting things about hardware design that push compilers in new directions. So for you know just a couple of examples, um, hardware can have combinatorial loops. You can't express that in software because there's already a notion of execution, but this is something you do and you can do in hardware and it is done. So how do you have compiler representations that can represent these new constructs? Um, there's a lot of things like when it comes to physical placement where you will say, I have 30 ALUs in my design, but this one right here needs to go right here on the chip. So now if you think about that from a software perspective, you're talking about uh, call path specific information for a common function used in multiple different paths, but you actually want to talk about that particular call. There's an, that's an analogy to what you want to do in hardware. Another very interesting thing that we will talk about is getting Verilog emission right is challenging and getting pretty Verilog that's accepted by a lot of tools um, is, is a challenge. So we'll talk some about that later, um, but you know, Certainly go watch the talk, it has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, so Circuit, kind of getting to the technology, has a lot of pieces, right? It's built on the MLIR, so it's built around dialects. Dialects are representing specific concerns. Uh, for example, a particular front-end language might have a dialect or two for it. 
We might have other common dialects that people use for various purposes. We're going to talk more about those in a second. Um, and uh, Fertile, or sorry, and Circuit includes a number of production tools that are used in various places. We'll also talk about that. Um, there's a lot of good backend tools in, in the pipeline that you can reuse. And Circuit's really actively use both um, in several companies in production and a lot of research projects doing interesting things from formal methods to new languages. Uh, so hopefully if, you know, take a look at some of those and we will talk about some of the more common parts next. Circuit has a number of active subprojects, some of which we'll go into details later, but some of which we won't, but deserve honorable mention. The first of which is fast simulation. We have reason to believe if we keep the high-level operations around, we can compile them to native code where they'll run much faster than an RTL-level simulation. We additionally will have to lower them down to RTL to get the cycle-level uh, behavior. And so if we correlate the two, uh, you know, the simulations will run much faster. We have the scheduling framework to support HLS, but other dialects are finding it useful as well. The circuit scheduling framework you know, has some abstractions that take away uh, implementation details of the specific uh, solver. We also have an FSM dialect. This, uh, this is an abstraction that allows easier reasoning and manipulation of FSMs. We can then uh, produce a better uh, output code for both simulation and RTL customized to the tool that's being used to ensure that it picks up on the fact that this is a finite state machine. We also have System C support uh, for exporting uh, circuit design to System C. That way you can link it in to your existing System C simulations. We also do physical design on FPGAs. So what we have is uh, an instance hierarchy browser wherein you can specify the placements of various uh, instances uh, and uh, produce the, um, a set of constraints in Tickle with the correct instance paths. Lastly, and this is probably the most immature, we, we are aiming to allow designers to enter uh, design constructs at the level of FSMs, data flows, broadcasts. Um, then the compiler is free to pipeline them correctly while physically optimizing. So we call this uh, optimization placement first pipelining. So onto the core dialects. We have the HW dialect, which contains designer abstractions, things that designers like to reason about but don't actually synthesize to any hardware. Things like um, modules, things like types, uh, and this dialect is both complete and stable. Then we have a combinational dialect that contains all of the traditional, uh, you know, computational operations that you think about, like add, shift, multiply, divide, etc., etc. This is also both complete and stable. Then we have the sequential dialect. This is uh, incomplete because it only contains a simple register, but that register operation is stable. We need this to introduce a sense of time uh, in terms of cycles. Then we have the system Verilog dialect. This is for any system Verilog weirdness or uh, constructs that we don't explicitly capture elsewhere. So you'd use it when you want to produce prettier system Verilog, when you want to produce uh, something that you can uh, integrate better with external uh, tools and uh, your existing UVM tests. Then we've probably put in more, uh, an inordinate amount of time into exporting System Verilog. The problem with System Verilog is that it's a big standard and there's no two compilers that implement it the same way or the same subset of which. Um, so our goals are to make uh, the system Verilog both readable and compatible with all tools. And that requires supporting a number of tool-specific system Verilog variants. So some of the annoyances is um, some, some system Verilog parsers have a, a, a limitation on the number of tokens per line. And that gets, you know, uh, a, a, in generated system Verilog, that can get pretty crazy pretty quickly. So we're sensitive to that. Um, there's no, uh, the, the support for automatic logic, um, like that type, is uh, spotty at best. Um, some traditional Verilog simulators don't support this system Verilog construct. 
Some uh, some tools also don't support multi-dimensional arrays, unpacked arrays. Some don't even support structs. And then there are tool-specific optimizations. Um, there's a lot of uh, difference in how the tools support MUXs. This isn't particularly important for simulation, but for synthesis, it makes a world of difference. So, on to the details of the demo. So, on the left, you see the PyTorch kernel we're using. Uh, it is a simple vector dot product. Couldn't be, couldn't be more straightforward. On the right, you see the, uh, us compiling it down to MLIR using uh, Torch MLIR. So, now we want to get this to System Verilog. This map of everything in circuit is very complex. We only use a specific flow through it, and I'm gonna walk you through that flow now. So we take the, the kernel in PyTorch, and we use Torch MLIR to lower it into the MLIR world. Then we use standard MLIR uh, passes to transform it down to the arithmetic and control flow dialect. That's the point at which we pick it up and it enters the circuit world. We have a lowering that creates from the arithmetic and control flow dialect what we call a uh, handshake uh, dialect IR. Handshake is our dynamic data flow uh, dialect. That eventually gets into the core dialects. Everything funnels through these core dialects. And then the core dialects get outputted through uh, the export Verilog and end up in system Verilog form. But that gives us the, uh, the dot product um, IP block with you know raw wires and stuff like that. What we really want is an entire system, uh, you know, containing that module. So in order to do that, we um, we pick it up uh, through a Python script using the PyCDE API. Then we assemble the system in PyCDE um, using a technology we call ESI, which I'll go into later. Then we, uh, we do the, the standard thing and export the, the entire system as system Verilog through the standard flow. Additionally, ESI exports a system description, which we use to build uh, the software. So what is Handshake? Like I said, Handshake is our dynamic data flow intermediate representation. So uh, traditional HLS tools uh, schedule into you know a fixed number of cycles, uh, and you know it's very it's very static schedule. This, on the other hand, uh, the tokens just flow through uh, a dynamic data flow a, di a data flow graph, um, and that can actually be faster in some cases when you have complex unbalanced control flow uh, in particular. So th this is a different world wherein you need certain uh, operations to correctly implement. Um, the logic, and, and they're provided in this dialect. It ends up getting lowered to uh, ver uh, valid, uh, ready semantics on a per-operation basis. The implementation for the PyTorch kernel is shown on the right. I don't expect uh, you to understand this now, uh, but if you're interested, you can go read the documentation on the Handshake dialect and decode this uh, as homework. Okay. Now we move on to the PyCDE API, which is used for two things. It's used for system assembly. So in this, uh, on this API, you can stitch together IP blocks and, uh, and host connectivity using either ESI, which we use in the demo, or some kind of ad hoc wiring. So the demo imports the PyTorch kernel and wraps the raw wires into something that ESI understands. Um, in the future, the handshake dialect will produce the ESI uh, compatible uh, module itself. So this manual step is not, uh, will not be necessary in the future. The other thing it allows is to enter entire designs into circuit directly. So like I said, this is just an API. It's not a Python-based HDL. So we provide as much syntactic sugar as possible, but there are uh, cases where you just can't do that. Uh, particularly in behavioral constructs. This is really useful in replacing these ad hoc generator scripts that people tend to write uh, in Python or Tickle um, that just spit out textual system Verilog, which, as we saw earlier, won't be compatible or optimal with many tools unless you're specifically targeting it. 
This gets you all the goodness of the full circuit stack, such as optimizations and that system Verilog compatibility we discussed earlier. PyCD also has that instance hierarchy browser uh, API, which I uh, talked about earlier. Um, so we've had great success uh, inside Microsoft uh, using this to uh, physically optimize uh, an internal design. PyCD also will allow us to enter these high-level constructs and compose them. Uh, this is probably, you know, like I said, the most experimental thing I talk about here, uh, therefore I won't go into it in depth. Also, uh, so, so that, that builds on the theme of being able to expose uh, any circuit or MLIR operation. Uh, it won't be pretty, but we can do it with a small amount of code uh, per dialect. So, I was saying that we had to handwrite some, some wrapper functions, uh, uh, some wrapper functionality in PyCDE by hand. Um, this is, uh, you know, ugly, but uh, it will not be necessary in the future. It's a, it's a good example of, on the left, of how you declare a module in PyCDE um, using the uh, module decorator. And this is how you um, declare IO. Anyway, moving on to ESI. ESI is all about IP compatibility, uh, IP composability. Um, so, you know, one thing that we've noted is that this plumbing, as it's typically called, is both tedious and error prone. So it's really easy to create, you know, endianness bugs. Um, you know, CDCs are <laughs> notoriously easy to get wrong. Um, and that's because it's too low level, right? This is easily automatable. And so what we're doing is we're raising the level of abstraction and then letting the compiler, uh, you know, take care of the physical implementation. So one thing we do with regard to correctness is we ensure types uh, are compatible. So, you know, the idea here is that, you know, raw wire level protocols like AXI are great for specifying the wire level signaling semantics, but they don't carry types. The types are documented in the uh, IP block documentation in English. Um, whereas static type safety has been wildly successful in the software world at ensuring correctness. So we want to do away, or at least build on top of, some of these untyped standards, and then build on, uh, you know, build a type system, a high-level type system that's hardware-centric because you just can't represent certain things like variable size data in hardware currently. So we're, we plan on adding that support in the in the future. The other thing that types allow us to do is create a, a tailored, system-tailored API automatically to, to, to expose to software. So this, this API will be the same regardless of the interconnect, um, PCIe network or simulation. We use co-simulation in the demo. The other critical aspect of ESI is that it exposes a latency insensitive model for these interconnects. Now, the reason we do this is uh, to increase uh, IP to IP compatibility, and that allows us additionally to build host bridges um, or inter, you know, FPGA bridges, um, basically anywhere. These channels are cut points. So the, the problem we're trying to solve here in part is that in newer HLS technologies and HDLs provide easy host compatibility, but they control the top level, and they must target uh, uh, specific boards. So this can create both vendor lock-in and language lock-in. They all have, uh, to my knowledge, external interfaces, uh, so you can integrate System Verilog and that kind of thing. But you know, if System Verilog is your uh, standard, you know, uh, intermediate representation for uh, for these things, it's not going to go well. Um, so this solves the the many-to-many -many problem, right? So you need in in any of these new languages, you need to target every single board. So with ESI, all the new languages can produce IP blocks that have ESI compatible interfaces. Then board uh, vendors can support ESI uh, exclusively, 
or in, you know, uh, additionally. And then that provides a, a middle level uh, um, uh, point which everything can target. And that would allow us to build language heterogeneous uh, systems and then wire it to any board that supports ESI. So you could imagine composing a system that looks roughly like this. Anyway, uh, this is how we built the demo. So um, we have a vector inputs just specified in Python. They get sent through what will be automatically generated uh, Python API. Then they're sent over a well-known RPC protocol through, and uh, the RPC protocol in, uh, in, uh, interacts with the simulation via DPI. Then the, you know, the, the dot product gets computed in the RTL simulation and gets sent back through the same path. So this is only co-simulation, but coming soon, we'll be able to do this on actual FPGAs. So in this case, uh, you know, further on down the road, ESI will generate automatically uh, an API uh, that includes the, the types. Then it'll interface with some kind of host runtime, bridge over PCIe to the FPGA runtime, and then go through a PyTorch kernel actually running on an Azure Cloud FPGA, or AWS, whatever. So, this is how you assemble the system in PyCDE. It's important to note that ESI is language independent. It is a uh, circuit dialect, so it can theoretically be targeted from any, any language. The interface we have now is PyCDE. So this uses um, an ESI feature called services. We won't have time to go into that today, but as homework, you can go through this slide and try to figure out what's going on. Documentation on ESI is uh, forthcoming, as well as the documentation on PyCDE. So here's how you interface with co-simulation or basically you know, any other um, uh, you know, uh, hardware implementation when we get there from Python. Now it's really only these four lines in the run method that are interacting with cosim. So you install the A vector into uh, one memory, you install the B vector into the other one, then you just say go, then sometime later it'll return the result. Then you, you know, this is a sanity checking function wherein it computes what torch actually would compute and compares it. Then down here, you just instantiate the, the, the test um, and get the co-simulation information and that's it. Now, of course, I said that we didn't uh, have automatic API generation support. So we had to build this um, API by hand. It is, you know, kind of brittle, kind of ugly, um, but in the future, uh, ESI will be generating this or something like this uh, automatically. So circuit depicted here is how we get from this to this. There are, however, a few caveats. This did not produce efficient hardware. Um, it only works for a subset of the PyTorch kernels. Um, and it took a few days worth of ad hoc scripting, uh, you know, mostly in the, in the wrappers I showed you, you know, in the interest of transparency. Um, however, the PyTorch HLS flow doesn't have major funding from any company. It's been a ragtag group of interns, stu students, part-timers who got this done and working. So I think this demonstrates the power of circuit. Uh, you know, building on top of the MLIR framework provides an easy way to get from uh, you know, high-level MLIR, MLIR languages to something in circuit. It also provides a common ground on which we can build on each other's work. Without this, this work, uh, you know, the PyTorch HLS flow that we built would have been infinitely harder. So that was one uh, end to end demo using a lot of circuit. I want to talk about another thing that we are using in production, um, which is a chisel compiler. So what is chisel? Chisel is a, uh, another hardware generator um, embedded in Scala, and it is trying to give Scala, you know, hardware designers a lot of the richer 
um, language features that you expect from modern programming languages for designing their hardware. Um, Chisel is used extensively by Sci-Fi. We use it in all of our products. Um, so we have a lot of tooling and workflows built around it. Uh, when you build something like this, you'll quickly get to the point where compiling straight from your language to your output is very tedious and uh, broken because there, there is such a semantic leap. So you wind up introducing an IR and compiler technology. And that is what the role of Fertile is trying to fill. So Fertile is an IR designed for chisel to target, which is then where all the compilation happens to generate system Verilog um, and a number of other kinds of outputs. So doing this gives you kind of the classic compiler goodness of, of semantic analysis and global analyses and lowering complex language features progressively. So Fertile does all of those kinds of things. Um, but interestingly, once you have this IR, it's a much more convenient place to build tooling than in the front end or the back end language. So Fertile is a very nice abstraction point for building custom transformations uh, for various design concerns or um, for building analyses across, across your platform. Uh, once you have a common IR, you can also do other interesting things like target more than just synthesis in the case of Fertile. You can do high level simulation, you can do custom transformations for improved FPGA simulation, uh, you can generate auxiliary outputs for things like IP exact and SOC assembly. Um, you can do things like that. So it's very, it's very nice there and a lot of tooling is built around this. Uh, so what are we doing with Circuit? Uh, so in Circuit, you can find Fertile, which is a full implementation of the Fertile compiler. So Chisel gives us a fur file, which is the IR. And then we do all the classic compiler things. We take it, we parse it, we lower it, we check it. Uh, we do optimizations. We route through, as John said earlier, common Circuit dialects to do Verilog emission and bunch of other tooling is built at different points in this pipeline as appropriate. Um, this is a production compiler that we have shipped uh, cores to customers now. And in the near future, the circuit-based compiler will be the standard fertile compiler for the Chisel stack. So that transition has started. Um, Chisel circuit Sorry, Fertile uses a lot of kind of the standard compiler constructions uh, encouraged by MLIR. So we have pass pipelines um, with a bunch of passes. We have progressive lowering. So it's nice to lower different parts and different concerns of your design at different times to different dialects. Uh, so for example, we deal with a lot of kind of side metadata separately from dealing with stateful elements, which we deal with separately from uh, logic. We also, just as building projects on top of Circuit gets you a lot of uh, functionality for free, Circuit uses MIR to get a lot of functionality for free. So we get a lot of common compiler transformations that we can extend for our specific hardware-centric dialects. Now, like I said, this is a production tool that we are using on our designs. Um, and between this, uh, this these numbers are old. Uh, these are just looking at fertile improvements, but between this and other chisel improvements, we're seeing around a 10x reduction in runtime for developer inner loop from making changes in the Scala chisel source code to being able to run a simulator. And it's not just that, we're also seeing a massive more than 10x reduction in memory usage. And these two things, as we were forecasting as designs were getting larger, we're getting to the point where we could not reasonably find machines that could had enough memory to compile designs, nor could compile them in a reasonable time frame, where the time frames were projected out to be days or longer as we looked into the future. So building on industrial strength compiler technology to really cut those numbers down has been critical to continuing to scale the complexity of our designs. Uh, so let's do a quick demo. All right, for our example, we are going to do a simple ALU. So if we look at our, our ALU, I have 
did in Scala here. Um, so here's my nice chisel ALU. I'm going to use structs because that's going to be interesting to talk about later. Um, this ALU is parametric over the data type it takes and the operations it's going to perform. The operations are going to be a list of functions and the index in the list is the opcode. So the ALU is going to uh, execute all of them in parallel and then mux the output of all those operations together to give you the uh, result desired. Here is our here are our operations we're going to use in this example. So we have a bunch of little operations, then we're going to make an ALU and we're going to spit it out to a file. So let's go ahead and run this through chisel. And we get a fertile file. This is what we're going to pass to the circuit-based tooling. Uh, we see we have our inputs, which are structures. We see all the operations that we were talking about earlier uh, that our ALU does, and then it goes into this big muck structure at the end uh, to give you the outputs you asked for. Um, so let's go ahead and run this through uh, fertile in circuit to give you a Verilog file. So we're just going to run through the fertile command and we get a Verilog file. So a couple of things to notice. Uh, one is the structs, structures disappeared. This is because historically, Ver uh, Chisel did not uh, output structures or arrays. It scalarized your code for compatibility with a couple of specific tools. And this is something that we can control because we can control, we control the uh, pipeline so we can do it. We can turn this off. I'll show that in a second. The other thing to notice is that common sub-expressions like this comparison here got extracted by the system and put on a line to try to improve readability. But otherwise, this looks just like we were talking about before, where we have a muck structure and all the operations executing in parallel and being mucked together. You'll notice the muck structure is done not with ternaries or something, but with array indexes. Um, we have you know, had numerous discussions with various tool vendors um, on you know, the involvement in circuit on finding a good way to represent muxes that are universally supported by tools. Um, so part of the code generation stuff you get from Verilog is the benefit of all of these discussions we have about how to get maximally uh, performant and accepted Verilog output where the tools will actually infer the correct behavior based on what you want. So. Like I said, we can turn off the scalarization. So now I'm going to run Fertile again, but I'm just going to change the compilation pipeline to drop the scalarization pass. And now I get Verilog that has structures in it and is being indexed. Uh, so that's nice. Um, otherwise, it's the same as before. But again, there are lots of things we can control in the output pipeline. I'm going to run again, but this time I'm going to tell the Verilog emitter to not use as large expressions. Don't emit expressions that are as deep for statements. Um, so I'm going to limit it to one. And what this is going to do is it's going to limit the inlining of expressions into statements and cause the emitter to spill expressions that are too large to wires. And here, almost everything is spilled to wires because I picked a very small inlining depth. So we have the same functionality as before, right? Identical code, however, or identical functionality. However, all of the operations are now done one at a time and spilled to a wire, temporary. Um, but you know, at the end, we still get the same muck structures, unsurprisingly. So now if we take this, we can go back to our original Verilog. And we could say, for example, you know, do whatever we want with the Verilog, ship it to a customer, simulate it, what have you. I'm going to run it through Verilator. And that's going to give me, you know, a Verilated model that I can use for, you know, whatever I, I want to. So codes on the slide for easy review. There's also a link to the source uh, in case you want to try it yourself.
So stepping back, stepping back, where are we? So I said earlier that uh, Circa is trying to solve a lot of problems and provide common representation. And hopefully you've seen that it's starting to build a really solid foundation for that vision. Um, but it's also limited in what it's accomplished so far. So it's very focused on front end code input and out and code generation for the output. There's starting to be a lot of interest in uh, formal equivalents and simulation projects, physical layout. These are all starting, but Circuit is much less mature in those areas than it is in kind of Verilog generation. Um, so there's a lot of things, a lot of open projects that, you know, if you're interested in, would be very interesting to get into. Um, dealing with SOC assembly and the various standards in the industry for connecting IPs and describing them, dealing with power. These are some interesting domains we need to model. Obviously, we're going to need a Verilog parser. And once you have that, um, formal verification and simulation look a lot more interesting because now you can do cross-language and mix and match um, technologies for simulation. A lot of kind of back-end stuff like synthesis and place and route. Um, there's been some interest in, but it's very unexplored. And there's a lot of things you can do with dialects to start encapsulating vendor and technology specific knowledge into your design in a way you can reason about. Um, but generally, having the framework we have, as you've seen in the demos, really have allowed a lot of interesting exploration and projects going on, especially in the design entry space where people are asking, like, what does it mean to program a system? How, what does it mean to assemble a system? What should our programming models be? Those are kinds of things that are very interesting questions, and you don't want a Verilog generator, have to write a Verilog generator to answer those questions. Um, so um, besides the technology stack, Circuit is also trying to develop a community of people who are interested and passionate about improving hardware tooling. So there's an open design meeting every week. Um, you can come, you can join. We talk about uh, design, about concerns uh, in different domains, about composition, about what people are doing and technology people are working on, not even necessarily MLIR or circuit related, kind of any interesting hardware project uh, we are very interested to hear about. Um, there's notes going back a couple of years and there is a, most of the, most of the of them are recorded uh, going back a certain distance. So come hang out, give a talk if you would like. We'd love to, we'd love you to join. Um, so Circuit is really trying to build the same kind of foundation in the hardware world that LVM and related projects provided in software, right? Having a strong techn technological foundation so that we can pool the resources and, uh, abilities and strengths of everybody to build tools better and faster and more complete and more uh, and more robust. Um, so if this is interesting, please join us. Um, we have several ways for you to join us. There's a bunch of links for various discussion boards and source code. Come give it a try. Um, so I'd like to thank John for working on the presentation, Mike Erbach, who gave the initial initial demo at the beginning and did a lot of the heavy lifting to make that work um, and also to the entire circuit community for uh, all the good work and enabling this project. So thank you. Thanks a lot, John and, uh, and Andrew. It's uh, always great to see how far uh, circuit has come. It's definitely a project that's been very near and dear to, to my heart for a while to to see uh, this hardware generation capability come to the, the, to the compiler world. Um, I was wondering if maybe you guys could say a little bit about uh, scalability because it's definitely something that's, that's really important. And uh, I think Andrew talked about it a little bit in sort of a relative sense, but you know, scalability is also something that's important to think about from an absolute sense. You know, how, how big of a, of a design can we really put through this tool flow and and how, what are the things that have gone into the MLIR infrastructure to help make it scalable to support really large uh, designs that we see in the har hardware world, but, but also that we see in the software world too? Can you say a little bit about that? Excellent. Uh, so, so as I said, um, we were projecting out 
and designs to large multi-core, multi-cluster designs and seeing runtime issues. Um, that was one of the motivating reasons to invest in Circuit. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things. So Circuit is very extensively parallelized, um, not completely yet. There are a bunch of passes that aren't, um, but that's very important. Uh, efficient efficient data representation is very important. Efficient uh, representation for kind of elaborated properties matters a lot. Um, and so does just being, you know, kind of classic compiler bread and butter being very careful with your algorithmic work and your data structure work to make sure that uh, you get something good. Um, projecting forward, um, when we were starting to do multi-core stuff, we were seeing tools that were taking a couple of days to run um, and circuit implementation of those are getting down to uh, well under an hour. So kind of in an absolute sense for kind of a multi-core class machine, um, we're looking at trying to keep those runtimes very low. Um, generally in our workflow, the compilation uh, through circuit is no longer kind of a bottleneck. Um, we're, we have other tool bottlenecks that are more important. So um, but kind of projecting forward, there's plans to start dealing with distributed, distributed multi-machine compilation, caching, um, separable compilation for on the chisel side, which is chisel cur currently doesn't do. Um, so kind of starting to bring a lot of language techniques, standard language and system techniques into our workflows to, you know, improve scalability much further. So. Mm -hmm. And here, when you, you're talking about multiprocessor synthesis, you're talking about parallelizing the, the implementation flow over multiple processors. Um, but I, yes. I assume also the designs that you're talking about are large multiprocessor designs as well, right? You know, these are. Yep. Um, kind of going going into the 1632 core realm, um, that was not. Circuit has been critical for enabling that. So um, highly parallel, very efficient memory usage gets us to the point where we can do these high, you know, high level uh, language based design on reasonable machines and reasonable timeframes. Because you know we need multiple turnaround a day uh, kind of workflows for our designers to be able to make make progress. Yeah, and. Uh... One of the, the features that I think has been under discussion recently is also a binary format for MLIR. Is that something that you see as a big uh, bottleneck for you or uh, not so much? So it's something that we're very interested in. So um, I said, you know, MLIR gives you this notion of dialects and we have a lot of uh, specific representations of knowledge that you can keep together in one spot. Um, and that effectively means that your MLIR form starts working as kind of a touch point for all the tooling you're building in your workflows. Um, so really being able to load, you know, load, serialize, deserialize it quickly becomes really important because we are looking at use cases where individual uh, scripts written by verification people are going to be asking the MLIR representation questions about design, you know finding out layouts, finding out memory maps, uh, finding out wire names for specific stuff. So we really need uh, those kinds of fast use cases, um, which hopefully binary format will certainly help a lot with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's become really important. Yeah. Maybe we'll uh, switch over to John then. Um, I'm curious about uh, what you see with, uh, with the high level synthesis flows, John. Yeah. Um, as you're know, using a lot of the high level synthesis tools, there's a lot of, sometimes there's low level details kind of leak, leak back up in, into the high level uh, code or heaven forbid, you actually have to look at the generated RTL or, or the generated <laughs> net list to be able to, to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, in, in the ASIC world, there's things like ECO flows where you might have to make a very small change to your design, but you don't want to go through the, 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 the place and route flow from from scratch, and you know, oftentimes, in, even in an FPGA world, when you have very large designs, that can also be a problem. So, 
Uh, how, how do you see this this working out? Do you have to 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 uh, dig into the low level designs a lot, or are you happy designing at a high level in ESI? Or are these uh, there are cases where you have to to go look at the low level designs and un, and sort of infer or guess how the the high level ESI design relates to it? Yeah, so I've spent quite a bit of time debugging um, auto-generated, uh, circuit-generated RTL in the typical waveform debuggers. Uh, it ranges from painful to not so bad. Uh, if you if you end up with uh, decent wire names, which is something uh, that PyCDE allows, I don't know about the HLS flows. Um, in general, my feeling about HLS is that a lot of these implementation details tend to leak up to the top because um, it's not the right input technology. Like uh, C is C is not the right model for hardware. So you have to uh, you have to go up and and put a bunch of annotations on the C code in order to make it work reasonably. Um, and that's kind of why where I'm looking into these, these high level constructs um, so that you can, um, uh, so, so that you can design at a higher level. Um, additionally, I think MLIR's affine dialect provides a nice, um, a nice neat box around the kind of things that HLS technology can, can solve. Um, so, you know, any tool that gets you to uh, the, um, the affine dialect could be used um, instead of, you know, just C. Um, I haven't thought at all about ECO flows, so I don't have any particular thoughts there. Um, I, I do know that it's important for ASIC designs. Um, we have, we don't tend to use them a lot even on some of our larger designs at, at Microsoft, oh, for FPGAs. I was wondering, uh, Andrew, did you want to add anything? I know the, the chisel flow is, uh, has a historically been kind of difficult for some people to get into because it's not necessarily easy to simulate and debug and understand how it correlates down to, to hardware. Did you want to add anything about that? Yeah, I think for a lot of, higher level languages, this is kind of a core problem as long as the ecosystem is Verilog based. Um, it's really hard to do native debugging of something like Chisel. Um, you know, we, we have some work on those tools, but uh, it's preliminary. Um, but, and that fundamentally means like you have the thing you wrote, you have the thing it generated, and you have to debug that, but then you also have to debug the thing you generate to make sure it behaves correctly. Um, and this is uh, quite wasteful and certainly not something that's usually put up with on the software side of things. Um, so, you know, part, part of the benefit of starting to have a full stack with a common representation is we can start filling in some of these pieces on yep. the back end so that we get the end-to-end -end experience that's actually really usable uh, for for designers or other users and uh, gets you out of, you know, essentially staring at the assembly code equivalent, right? Like that's that's not a good place to be. So um, we're very interested in this. And I think any really good, interesting language attempt in this space needs to have a really good answer for that to make an impact. And on the debugging thing, we have, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to uh, to do high-level debugging. So, for instance, the handshake dialect you can visualize via graphs. And then um, we had a guy recently um, take a VCD and map it back to tokens in that diagram. So you can actually view tokens flowing through a handshake circuit. So that's just one example of something where I think of debugging, where I think we have a, a an opportunity to do something really, really neat and improve. Uh, debugging over these waveforms that nobody nobody likes is not productive. Um. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to have a, a 
the, the whole ecosystem sort of pulled together. Um, if you if you only have piece, bits and pieces and, and you are forced to ever sort of go down and, and debug at the RTL level or at the Verilog level, then you, you really lose a lot. I think that's true whether you're doing uh, sort of structural high-level hardware design like you would do in Chisel or whether you're doing more algorithmic high-level synthesis like you would do in C code. It, it, it's really important to have kind of good strong abstractions that that you don't have to ever uh, drill down into a, as much as possible. Um, so uh, I guess maybe one last question. Uh, you you mentioned that the handshake dialect, John. Uh, yep. Definitely in the in the software world, we're sort of familiar with basic blocks and and sequential control flow graphs. And, and you know, these are kind of common concepts in a, in a lot of compilers. And, and MLIR has a lot of built-in support for, for these kind of concepts. Um, so maybe you can say a little bit about the, the features of MLIR that are useful for hardware design and help to represent things like handshake designs. Um, so I'm not familiar with the HLS uh, handshake flow as much as I'd like to be. Uh, the idea there is we convert uh, control flow in MLIR to uh, data flow. Um, and so we need a bunch of data flow constructs to implement that control flow correctly, which I alluded to earlier. Um, I think where some of the ML, the real power of MLIR comes in is you have these high level dialects that we know how to optimize for hardware. So you have this affine dialect that I was talking about earlier, um, which you know the, we have a, a dialect that is does static scheduling uh, on this affine dialect. We have um, we have you, you know MLIR has this linear algebra dialect, so it should be possible to you know have a very highly optimized. Um, compilation flow down to, uh, you know, like a systolic array to implement uh, linear algebra stuff. Um, and that I think it's not so much the, the passes and, um, and that kind of stuff that we share with MLIR. It's the ability to reason about these things at a high level and where we know what to do optimally, uh, do it. And where we don't, you know, lower it down to something we can I deal with like the Aerith uh, arithmetic dialect and control flow dialect, which Handshake knows how to deal with. Right. Yeah, definitely leveraging those high level structures to, to build accelerators, I think, is yep. often a, a really important thing. You know, we we yep. often uh, very rarely build uh, accelerators that are sort of random logic. A lot of times exactly. there's a lot of structure, particularly in machine learning, with uh, the, yep. the kind of dense arithmetic that, that usually happens. We're building systolic arrays and things like that. So, so leveraging the high-level structure to be able to generate the hardware designs uh, is definitely very important. Yep. That's awesome. Uh, definitely thanks a lot for, uh, to both of you. It's been a, been a great talk and a great way of wrapping up this uh, MLIR tutorial that we've had today. Hope everybody enjoyed it and got something out of it. Uh, definitely, you see uh, a lot of different aspects of MLIR and different ways of using it. So I, I hope you get excited. And uh, definitely, I think hopefully you've met a few people who uh, you can reach out to and uh, would be happy to talk and, uh, and get you started in MLIR. Um, so uh, that's the end of our tutorial.